Good evening, everybody. Thank you for joining us for Landscape Transformation Basics. It's six o'clock now. We're gonna give it just another minute uh, for people who are in the process of logging in, and then we will get started. Okay, good evening, everybody. Thank you very much for joining us this evening. Welcome to the Landscape Transformation Basics Workshop. My name is Scott Kleinrock. I'm the Conservation Programs Manager at the Waterwise Community Center. And I'm look forward, looking forward to spending the next two and a half hours with you uh, going through the basics of taking on a large water conservation based landscape or garden project. Quick note before we get started, this presentation is available to download. So you can download all of the slides of this presentation as a PDF file if you wanna refer back to any of them. And you can do that at the web page located at the bottom of this page, cbwcd.org slash presentations. That's cbwcd.org slash presentations. That will take you to a web page that's just a list of links to all of the workshops that we've taught in the last couple of years and PDF files uh, of downloading all of those slides. And so you will be able to have access to the PDF file of the Landscape Transformation Basics Workshop. This workshop is also being recorded and you can rewatch this workshop after this presentation at cbwcd.org slash YouTube. That's cbwcd.org slash YouTube. That takes you directly to our past workshop YouTube playlist, where you'll be able to rewatch this workshop as well as 20 something other more kind of deep dive topic specific workshops on many different aspects of water wise landscaping and gardening. I want to tell you just a little bit about the agency that I am from and what we do. We are the water wise community center, our formal name for our agency is the Chino Basin Water Conservation District. We are a public agency. Technically, we're a special district. So similar kind of to a school district or a fire district, we were created by a public vote in 1949 to provide water conservation services to the western edge of San Bernardino County in Southern California. So we don't provide tap water to anybody or that sort of water service, but we work very closely with all of the other local water providers in the area on water conservation. We say our mission is threefold, to percolate, demonstrate, and educate. Percolation, as you can see on the right, has long been the bread and butter of our agency. We own and operate in coordination with other water agencies, a number of large-scale infiltration basins. Many of them are literally old gravel pits, which have been reconfigured and re-engineered to capture and through natural processes clean stormwater, which would otherwise leave our communities, and to allow that to slowly percolate down into our groundwater, which supplies about 60% of our local water supply. It's a huge resource, and these basins are a critical part of how we manage the recharge of that groundwater basin. We also collaborate with other agencies in some of the basins to infiltrate recycled water as well as imported water when it is sometimes available. And that's how we contribute to the supply side of water conservation, but we're also very active on the demand side of water conservation, which in our area is largely in the landscape. Average single family home in our area uses 60% of its water outdoors in the landscape. And so we demonstrate the multiple benefits of water efficient landscapes, primarily through a beautiful demonstration garden that's free and open to the public at our facility in Montclair. 
And it is currently closed due to COVID, but we are looking forward in the next few weeks to getting that open and it will be free and open to the public uh, four days a week initially. And then we'll be opening it up more as the summer goes on. We also do lots of education for all sorts of different groups from curriculum integrated K through 12 programs to workshops, as well as one on one programs for homeowners and community members in our local service area. I'll talk some more about those later on, as well as collaborations with nonprofits and trainings for landscape professionals. The best way to stay in the loop of everything that we have going on and coming up is to sign up for a monthly newsletter if you don't get it already. And you can do that at cbwcd.org newsletter. It's not a lot of junk. We don't share your email address with anyone else. It is just one email per month with program or workshop updates and sometimes other great gardening and water conservation content. So before we jump into the formal program, I want to tell you just a little bit more about who I am and why I'm talking to you about this. For those of you who are here at the very beginning, this is a repeat, but my name is Scott Kleinrock. I'm the Conservation Programs Manager at the Waterwise Community Center. I have a background in horticulture, landscape management, as well as landscape design and landscape construction management before I joined the staff at the Waterwise Community Center. But beyond that, I'm also an avid home gardener and I have taken out many lawns at places I've lived over the years and working for and with family members as well as private consulting uh, and installed many Waterwise gardens. Uh, it's something that my partner and I really value uh, at our current home in Pomona. And so everything I'm going to talk to you about tonight is something that I'm, I'm really very passionate about. I really feel that we can get much more out of our landscapes than we generally ever got from our more kind of conventional landscapes when we move in a Waterwise direction. So I'm excited to share that with you. So that's a little bit about me. Before we start, you will also tell me just a little bit about you by filling out this poll. And quick question that came in on the chat. Uh, no, you're not supposed to see me on the screen. Good question. I don't share the video of myself because that makes the main screen quite a bit smaller and you just see my face saying words. I'd rather you be able to concentrate on the images and the text on the screen. So you'll hear my voice, but you won't see my face kind of the talking head this evening. So the poll has opened up in your Zoom interface. If you could please just quickly uh, click all the responses that are appropriate, then we will share some of those responses and jump into the main program. This really helps me uh, both get metrics that I need for tracking the program, as well as the last couple of questions help me know more about who's in the audience so I can provide you the best content. For those of you who are joining us from other areas, uh, please type into the chat function where you are joining us from. Everybody is very welcome. Have San Mateo County, Monterey, welcome. Few people from Canada, welcome. Cool, California. Never heard of that. Welcome. Okay, so about half people are done with the poll. We'll give it just another minute or so, so everyone can finish. San Antonio, Texas, welcome. So for those of you who are from other areas other than Southern California, some of what we talk about tonight will be Southern California specific. The gardens pictured are from Southern California, but many of the concepts are going to be applicable wherever you are. New York City, welcome, Ellen. Uh, so yeah, it'll give you in some ways a glimpse into what it's like gardening in Southern California, but the, the principles, especially as we talk about landscape design in general and turf removal, if you're gonna be putting in a water-wise garden after that, will apply wherever you are. Just another few moments as the results continue to come in. 
thank you for your patience, those of you who have finished already. Have Melbourne, Australia, Bellevue, Washington, Rhode Island. Okay, I'm going to end the poll so we can move on. If you haven't had a chance to finish all of it, that's just fine. Don't worry about it. So let's take a look at the results. The first couple of questions aren't that interesting. They just help us with our metrics. But the ones that I really like to work at, uh, look at are uh, a little bit, little bit different uh, than we normally get for question number five. What is the current state of the part of the yard you are thinking about renovating? 14% uh, of people have a beautiful green lawn don't want to put the work into that or spend the resources probably anymore. We get a lot of people in that situation, but usually not the majority. 22% uh, of people have a green-ish lawn, maybe some patches that are brown and not looking to put all the work into it to get that thing beautiful and still not get that much out of a space you probably don't use. Uh, but slightly more than that, 25% have it down to a patch of weeds, not a lawn anymore. That's actually a little bit of a uh, little bit of a easier situation than if you have a full lawn, but all of the lawn removal techniques will work. Okay, then some people down to bare dirt and some people already have a water wise garden. A few people don't have a particular yard or project, but interested in the topic. This class is for any of you, no matter what stage you're at, we're going to have tips and techniques that apply. And then number six, why have you not planted your water wise garden already? These are very typical results. Number one, coming up with a design, 53%. Uh, that's more than, uh, more than twice any of the other results. And we are gonna spend the significant amount of this workshop talking about that. We are also gonna talk a little bit about finding a contractor. We're gonna talk a little bit about taking out your lawn. Uh, I'll connect you with other resources talking about site preparation a little bit about irrigation and watering. And then we have other resources about planting and taking care of the garden once you put it in. So thank you very much for participating in that. And with that, we will get going. We're gonna start our workshop tonight with a premise which is that landscapes take up a lot of space in Southern California. If you are looking at an aerial photo of Southern California, or satellite view, it's very different in most of our areas than like middle of New York City or middle of downtown Los Angeles. There's actually a significant amount of green, whether it's trees or lawns or landscape, and it's mostly trees or lawns still in our urban and suburban areas. And so maybe we have more asphalt and concrete than we need, but there is still a significant amount of space that's green or potentially green. And especially if we look at the suburban front yard areas, for a long time, the question has been, does the front yard fit in with the neighbors? And usually that meant lawn, maybe a tree, maybe a couple of roses or foundation planting. If someone was gonna be eclectic and go beyond that, most of the time, the conversation ended at, what does it look like? What's it going to look like? And what it looks like is very important. I think our front yard and backyard landscape should be beautiful and inspiring, but we can go beyond that. The last series of droughts really opened up the opportunity for a new question when it comes to the landscapes that we're putting the effort, the resources, the time or the money into maintaining. And so beyond does it fit in and beyond what does it look like, we now can ask ourselves, even in our public facing front yard landscapes, what do our landscapes do for us? 
And it's been really exciting to see the responses over the last number of years in Southern California to the last series of droughts, because it's really opened things up in terms of what might be expected or accepted in a front yard, even in homeowners associations, where they can no longer refuse to let people take out their lawn and put in a waterwise landscape. There can be restrictions, but there's a lot of different things that are accepted or even valued. And in some of the fancier neighborhoods now, it's very typical for the lawn to go out and a water-wise landscape to go in and preparing to sell the house. So that's really cool. So what do we want our landscapes to do for us in exchange for the care and resources we give them? And so this is just example of these last two pictures from my front yard, where in addition to being beautiful, what we wanted our front yard to do is be filled with native plants that provide habitat for native songbirds, butterflies, and pollinators. And so this is right outside the window of the desk I'm sitting at right now doing this workshop. And this is a black Phoebe that comes around to our garden very regularly and hunts little insects. You can see it caught something in its beak right there. And so in addition to supporting that wildlife that needs good habitat within our urban areas, I get to see all of that happen. I get to see the Phoebe flying around and doing all these aerial acrobatics, hunting little insects here and there. Also helps keep down the mosquito population in the neighborhood. So that's nice. Uh, so this is one of our big premises for this evening. California native and water-wise landscapes do more. And for those of you who are joining us from beyond California, this is gonna be true with the native landscapes or the native plants to where you are. We can get so much more out of a native or water-wise landscape than we are likely to get out of the conventional landscape that it's replacing. Not only that, it's going to take less inputs, whether that's generally time or water, definitely much less fertilizer, no need for pesticides, much lower on many other resources. And so before we jump into it, I realized that I forgot to mention how to ask questions and interact with me this evening. Got excited and jumped to the content. So if you have questions as we go, feel free to type them into the Q&A function. So in your Zoom interface, you should see a button or an area you can click that says Q&A and has a couple of little text bubbles. You can click on that and that'll launch something where you can type in your questions. Just type them in as they go. I'm going to be keeping an eye on that. And in between different sections or different topics, if questions have come in, I will stop and answer them. The questions that I'll be able to answer as we are going are going to be more the questions that respond to generally the topics that we're talking about. If you have more specific questions about how something might apply to you uh, personally, I will try to answer all of those questions. I might have to hold some of those to the end of the workshop uh, as well though. And then if you have other just kind of general comments, feel free to type them into the chat. I do read all of the questions or all of the comments into the chat at the end and take those all into account. But for actually asking questions, the Q&A uh, panel allows me to kind of track and respond to those better as we go. So with that, we will keep going. So those California native, native and water-wise landscapes do more. So let's see what they do. They're beautiful. Just as beautiful as the higher water and higher resource using conventional plants that they are replacing. These are some of my favorite, mostly California native plants, most of which require water no more than every four or in some areas, three weeks in our area in the summer once they're established. Quite low water plants, extremely beautiful, probably more beautiful than the vast majority of conventional plants they're replacing and much more adapted to place. So whatever style that you're after, there is a way to do it with water-wise or native plants. In addition to being beautiful, if you're working with the plants native to your area, they provide habitat for birds, pollinators, butterflies, lizards, and so on and so on. And once you provide all of that, uh, it continues to then kind of work its way up even to hawks and things like that, that uh, are cool to see coming through your yard or checking things out. And in most of our areas, habitat is needed. 
in many of our urban and suburban general areas, habitat is still being lost. It's we're still developing out in the general area where I am from the western edge of San Bernardino County in San Bernardino and providing homes for the critters that are delightful to have around is something we can do. There's lots of things that it feels like we can't do about environmental or habitat loss situations, but it is something that we can do. And it's not gonna replace the need for wildlife preserves and those larger scale approaches, but we can take that on. If you like a more naturalistic garden style, that's really gonna be the, the maximum, but you can even have a much more formal style, but working with native plants to your general area or your state and provide tons of habitat. And then you'll get to see things on an almost daily basis like butterflies and hummingbirds. You might get a hummingbird nest in your yard one year. And all of that makes our water-wise and native gardens more enjoyable places to live and to learn. And that extends not just into the outdoor space, but with the views into the outdoors from in your house. So it can really change the sense of your whole property, especially with things like birds. You might be able to see or hear some of them in the background at my house right now. Uh, our best bird watching happens when we're inside the house because the birds are more likely to come around and we see amazing things uh, on a daily basis, just kind of looking out our windows because we've surrounded our house with a native garden. And so whether it's for your own enjoyment or your kids or your grandkids, you really can get so much more out of your yard. It's different than conventional gardening because when you embrace a native garden, you are embracing the season. So a lawn in a hot, dry area, you're applying a lot of water. You're often applying a lot of fertilizer with the idea of keeping your landscape like a static picture, like a picture in a magazine, and you're gonna do the mowing or hire someone to do it and the watering and the fertilizing so the look never changes. With a native garden to where you are, you're embracing the seasons and things are gonna be different in the fall and in the spring and in the summer and in the winter and the life that comes to your garden. Some of the bird life, for example, is gonna be there year round. And then sometimes you'll get uh, seasonal birds that might spend the warm season down with you and then the cool season somewhere else. And you get to enjoy those cycles all throughout the year, which is much more interesting than trying to battle a lawn into being a flat green plain. Uh, a lot of times people think the kids need a lawn to play on. And if you're going to use that lawn space, you know, maybe you do want to have some of it, but maybe you don't need as much. But these very interesting dynamic interactive gardens are also great places for kids and can captivate some of that sense of nature and wonder without having to go to the mountains. It's great to go to the mountains if you can do that, but to have that right outside your doorstep can be something that's available every single day. So I really like this quote from Lady Bird Johnson, former first lady. She was one of the first kind of very public nationwide proponents that people should work with plants native to where they are. And she said, native plants give us a sense of where we are in this great land of ours. I want Texas to look like Texas and Vermont to look like Vermont. And I'm much more cynical than Lady Bird Johnson, but here's my take. It costs so much to live in Southern California. Why would I want my yard to look like a parched imitation of an East Coast or maybe even European landscape style, which is our traditional style, even in Southern California, when instead for less water, less resources, less maintenance, I can wake up to the natural beauty of California every day and enjoy it every evening. So that's the way that personally I would like to go. And so just a couple more pictures of inspiration. This is a all California native picture of a Pasadena front yard landscape was designed and installed by the homeowner. This was his first native garden. He did a great job on it, I think. A relatively small front yard and the house is on a side street, but pretty close to a main street. And this front yard totally changes the feel of not just the yard, but how the house sits on that property. The layers of vegetation and the kind of natural approach makes the house feel a lot more set back kind of in its own space and brings so much life and color year round to this landscape. If you like a more formal kind of approach, you can also achieve that with water-wise and native plants. So this is probably an 80% California native 
uh, species front yard landscape with some other Mediterranean and water wise plants. S much less water than the lawn that it replaced using native yarrow, which in this situation kind of wall to wall in a hot inland area is maybe medium water use, but then very low water use plants in most of the surround. And with all the clipping to shape, you'll lose a little bit of that wildlife habitat value, but still a uh, night and day difference in terms of how much it can support the local songbirds and butterflies and pollinators compared to a conventional front yard landscape. So whether you like a more formal style or you like a more naturalistic style, you can still have that working with the kinds of approaches and the kinds of plants we're talking about. So the next question I often get is great, but where do I start? And one of the big answers is you don't start here. You don't start at the nursery because when you start at the nursery, what happens is you end up getting one of this and two of that and something has a really nice flower in the one gallon pot, but then you bring it home and you realize it's gonna be 12 feet wide and you don't really have the space to do that. So maybe you plant it too close to a path and you hope for the best, but a year later you're having to hack it back and the thing looks strange. And maybe you have too many plants that want full sun, but some of them had to get planted in part shade and now they're not thriving. So just going to the nursery and buying great plants is not how I encourage you to start. Even people who uh, have been gardening for a long time, that's not necessarily a recipe for success if you are working on a significant size project. You'll get there eventually, but where I encourage you to start is with your goals. Once you really think about your goals for an area, how you wanna use the space, how you want it to feel, you can then start the process of design, which doesn't need to be complicated or rocket science. I'll kind of show you a path forward through that that can be very step by step. And once you think that all through, then you can go to the nursery and get your plants and you'll be sure that instead of a semi-random assemblage of plants, you'll end up with a lovely garden that meets your goals. So here's a list of goals from the most challenging clients I've ever had to work with because they're my parents. And so I had been used to working with uh, clients and places of work where people wanted to work with me because they respect my knowledge and experience in this field. And working for your parents is always a little bit different. But I learned a lot on the project and it's a lovely garden space now. And my father's list of goals was actually pretty easy. It was whatever makes your mom happy. But my mom had a large list of goals for her backyard, which was actually a pretty small space. So the goals were a comfortable place to sit and read, a place that feels relaxing, the sound of water to help dampen the noise from the neighborhood, all the, the uh, leaf blowers and string trimmers going on with all of the other uh, gardens and landscapes in the, the area, something that would be relatively simple to maintain, something that would hide the less than attractive cinder block wall all around the backyard without spending a lot of money, something that would attract birds, look nice, a space to grow some vegetables and cram that all in while making a small space feel bigger. And we could accomplish this through coming up with a simple but nice design that meets those goals for that space, but it is never going to happen if we start by hitting the nursery and buying the plants that make us excited. So we have resources to help you with the plant selection part. Stay tuned for that. We'll be getting to that later in the workshop. So just a quick, once through on how that project went. This is April 2015 when we had freshly removed the lawn and we're getting ready to plant. This is planting day and this is actually a pretty high density of plants because we went with a meadow concept for the backyard. Most landscapes would have even uh, fewer plants than this and just using uh, simple tools, uh, stakes, a uh, strap that we can pull in a circle by tying a loop around the stake and flower to kind of mark out the paths and then walking around the design that we had decided on and seeing if we need to nudge a plant here, move a plant there, change something around. Once you have your design on paper, uh, doesn't mean that you have to plant everything in that exact place. It's just a tool to help you get to something that you're excited about. That's April, 2015. This is right after planting a few days later. And this is the point where most people think, oh my God, I should have bought plants that are way bigger. I should have put way more plants in. It's a sea of mulch and just a few small plants. It'll never grow in. If you researched your plants, you researched the size that they're going to get, you spent some time on your design, don't give in to that impulse if that's what you're feeling. Have faith that it will grow in. 
So that's April, and this is October of the same year. It's a garden. And so to meet all of those goals for this, we went with a simple California native, very tough and flexible sedge. It's a grass-like plant called Berkeley sedge, which we bought small and repeated all throughout this kind of meadow landscape. And then mixed in different native and Mediterranean climate grasses. We mixed in some bearded irises, tough from the Mediterranean and other accents. And so you can see here, we have the sound of water, we have the place to sit and read. Looking back, you can see how narrow this area is at the main house and the paved patio area. But by separating our landscape elements or our elements that we wanted, our goals in the garden, with chunks of landscape and thinking through where those should all go, we even in the small area created some kind of small separate spaces and then wove together with the planting how that would all go together. And so you can see here in the even narrower side of the yard, room for uh, a small fruit tree on one side and then the vegetable bed looking back towards an old lemon tree, which was one of the two existing trees which we kept in the yard. You can see the meadow area and then the house is just a few feet away on the left. And it truly is, if you build it, they will come. So in the front yard, we had more habitat focused plantings. In the backyard, uh, not as much, but just having fresh recirculating water will bring a lot of life. So here is a falcon. This is a uh, pretty urban, dense suburban Van Nuys, Southern California. And we have a hawk coming down to take a drink and see what's going on, or a falcon. And you can see here the very tough creeping fig that is growing without needing any additional trellis and support to just kind of green up that back cinder block wall. With some flowering tough Mediterranean accents of Australian kangaroo paws and South African red hot poker. And so that's kind of just one example of using the design process to meet all of your goals, bringing in the plants as appropriate when you get there, making sure that your landscape overall is gonna meet your goals. So here's a little bit of other inspiration Here's a monarch butterfly getting some nectar off of a native yarrow plant, which is one of my very favorite plants for home gardens and shady spots or areas that get just a little bit more water. It's a very, it's a pretty low water plant overall. And so the style that you approach can be anything that you really can think of. So this is a very modern front yard with a closer and kept lower Berkeley sedge, little lawn area and just a very low water blue Canyon Prince wild rye grass, and then a couple of native trees. You can think about patio spaces, like this Desert Museum Palo Verde, anchoring this patio space at the California Botanic Garden in Claremont, or informal patio spaces like this gravel back patio. Uh, one of the nice things about working with these kind of native or low water landscapes is that the kind of organic approach to the hard elements works very well and it has a bunch of additional benefits. Having a gravel patio like this, as opposed to a formal paved patio, allows water when it falls. Instead of having to wash off the sides and you have to deal with what to do with that water or maybe install drains, in most cases, that water is just gonna soak in right through the gravel, which will keep water in place in the garden, will eventually help infiltrate into groundwater, will help keep your landscape hydrated as the roots grow out and underneath this area, but it will be deeper down. You probably won't have surface roots that'll cause any problems. Uh, and it's really a lot less expensive to install. And then it can just sweep right to the edge of your planting. So like in this uh, beautiful combination of great smelling native sages, mixing in for sculptural effect, some succulents and South African aloes. And in front yard spaces, you do start to see social spaces pop up like this fire pit and bread oven, surrounded then by quite low water native plants and wildflowers. Again, if you like that more formal look, you have plenty of choices to do that. Or play with the mix of formal and informal. I really like this modern style where they use those very square pavers in a formal layout with the decomposed granite in between, but that strong structure then let the landscape area be kind of very wild and naturalistic. It's a very nice interplay. Or if you like to go with an almost completely naturalistic kind of approach, this decompo 
composed granite path with river rock edging and a mixture of native perennial and uh, meadow plants. Absolutely lovely. So whatever your approach is, there's gonna be a variety of different ways to do it. If you're joining us from outside of Southern California, you can find examples of similar approaches from very wild looking to very formal looking for your area and find great projects that you might wanna emulate in your home garden. For those of you in Southern California, rebates are available to help make it happen. And so wherever you are in Southern California, SoCalWaterSmart.com is the main portal for the large rebates that are available. The local water providers work with the Metropolitan Water District who administers this central kind of rebate hub. And so current rebates through SoCalWaterSmart.com are the turf replacement rebate. We're gonna talk more about that. The dollar amount depends on your water provider, but it starts at $2 per square foot for removing turf and installing landscapes that meet all those requirements. And we'll talk about those. And for those of you who aren't eligible for the rebate, all of those requirements are good things to consider putting into your landscape. So it's gonna be relevant to you as well. Uh, Weather-based irrigation controllers, those are irrigation controllers where you need to figure out how to program them for the peak summer season. We have other workshops that are available on our YouTube page and that are going to be coming up throughout the summer that really go into irrigation uh, deeply and how to know how to set that up. But once you set them up for the summer, they actually either have a small little weather station on board or the newer generation connects to your home Wi-Fi system and they will automatically adjust the runtime of the zones of your irrigation system based on the weather. So it's a great way to save a lot of water and it can really update you know, every time it runs. So if it's cool or overcast for a week, it'll know to water less, save you maximum amount of water. The rebates for those start at $80 in our local area. Uh, it's $160 because the local water agencies chip in some extra and that's automatically processed through SoCalWaterStartMart.com. So they have a function where it says estimate my rebate and uh, you then will be able to find out for your local area what you would get. And then they also have a rebate on rotating sprinkler nozzles. If you have a large yard and you're going to be replacing traditional sprinkler nozzles with the high efficiency rotating ones, you can then go and get part of that paid for. Again, starts at $2, but some local water agencies like in our local service area are kicking in extra money. If you are in our local area, which means you're a customer of Monta Vista Water District, Ontario, Chino, Chino Hills, Cucamonga Valley Water District, Fontana, or Upland, you can also qualify for a free smart timer or weather-based irrigation controller installation program. And so what that program is, is instead of having to do the rebate with taking an online class, you can then get uh, set up to have a landscape contractor who is on contract with these water agencies come and swap out your irrigation controller for a new weather-based model. They'll come out and do a quick audit of your landscape because they're going to ensure that there are not like big leaks or problems with the pipes or nozzles so that uh, there wouldn't be water saved anyways. If there are anything, they'll make a list for you of things to fix and then you can requalify for that program. And so to start doing that and get signed up for that, it's a little bit different depending on your water agency, but essentially you want to get in touch with your water agency and contact the conservation staff member about getting signed up for the weather-based irrigation controller installation program you can start with customer service and ask about it there and they should be able to get you set up. And then turf replacement rebate is, is the big one through SoCalWaterSmart.com. With that, you can get a rebate. So you apply for the program, you get approved, then you remove your turf, then you install your new landscape, and then you can formally apply for your check after your new landscape is fully installed and you can apply for per square foot up to 5,000 square feet per fiscal year that they have funding. And so that's July to June. That can be any combination of square feet in your front, back, and side yards. And the base is $2 a square foot. However, local water agencies also chip in extra, sometimes for residential properties. So in most of our local area, it's $3 a square foot where we serve and Monta Vista Water District happens to be a little bit higher. 
And that needs to, in addition to removing the turf, uh, needs to meet program requirements, which we will talk about. Uh, so you can't just remove the turf, put in wall to wall gravel and a couple of cactuses. Uh, it needs to be kind of an exemplary project. And that doesn't necessarily mean expensive, but it needs to meet minimum requirements. So here are some kind of top tips that I've developed based on the questions that I get from people who are considering the rebate. We're just gonna spend a few minutes on this and then we'll be moving into things that are more uh, applicable for everybody else on the workshop, whether or not you qualify for this program. So for the rebate program, big thing is you cannot begin any work on your project until after you have received approval for your rebate. They actually do come out and audit by checking on site about 10%, I believe, of participants. So if you've already torn out your lawn, then you'll be out of luck because it is for removing lawn and replacing it with the water-wise landscape, not just to put in a nice water-wise landscape. The lawn doesn't need to be green, it can be very patchy or like mine was brown because I had stopped watering it. That's fine. You don't need to use water greening it up, but that turf, that kind of thatch still needs to be there. When you go to SoCalWaterSmart.com, you go to the rebates header, select available rebates and go to turf replacement program. And this has all of the detailed information. You're going to need to know your total lot size. So not just the areas that you are going to be you're going to be removing, but also just the total property size. One quick way to find that if you don't have that handy is type your address into any search engine like Google, and it will automatically pull up uh, real estate websites that automatically generate profiles of every property from a database. And you can find somewhere on there your lot size. This is for a headquarters facility. So it's giving it to us in acres because it's a large property. But for most of you, that'll be in square feet, which is what you need. You're going to have to have already decided which areas of your turf will be transformed, front side and or backyard, and the number of square feet of each that will be removed. Remember that it'll pay per square foot up to 5,000 square feet. This may or may not cover the entire cost of the project, depending on many factors. We'll talk about that a little bit more later in terms of uh, costs for projects. And to do that, you can measure areas by hand, or you can try using Google Maps measuring tools. So if you go to maps.google.com, like you are getting directions from Google, you can type in your property, zoom in as much as possible. In the lower left-hand corner, you can click on a square that says satellite and it brings up the satellite view and you can kind of line things up. And then you can actually right-click with your mouse and pull down to a window that says measure and access a measuring tool where you can make a connect the dots drawing. And when you finish that connect the dots over an area, if it's an odd shape, then it will actually tell you the square footage. If it's a simple yard, like a rectangle, it's better to measure it out a little more accurate to measure it out and do the math. But if it's an odd shape, this can be very useful. You're also going to need to choose which quote stormwater retention feature approach you're using. So in addition to putting in low water plants, you're going to need to put in a feature that holds on to a certain amount of the water when it rains. And so think something like a dry stream bed, also called a rain garden, uh, a swale, which is essentially a can be planted, but a, a nicely designed ditch that will strategically hold water or you could use rain barrels or cisterns. And we'll talk about those approaches a little bit later. You'll also need to let them know the total number of plants that are gonna be planted as part of the project. The requirement is at least three plants per 100 square feet to be planted. And so that means, for example, if you're putting in a, if you're removing a thousand square feet of turf and applying for the rebate for that 1000 square feet of turf, you're going to need to put in a minimum of 30 plants. Most landscapes, just to do a nice job on the landscape, are going to have more, but it depends on the size of the plants you're working with. And to be clear, that doesn't mean every 100 square foot area needs to be like gridded out with three plants, but it's over the total project area. You'll also need to upload a recent copy of your water bill, a copy of your landscape plan. Don't let that be intimidating. I've seen lots of examples of things that they've approved. Some of them look like they were drawn by a seven-year-old, but just roughly the shape of your property, uh, kind of conceptually what you're gonna do in each area, doesn't need to have every single plant identified, but just kind of what's gonna be happening where, maybe some of the plants, or in this area, I will be putting in you know, some of this list of plants, uh, whatever's gonna work. If it's a beautiful drawn on graph paper to scale landscape plan, that's great. But if you can't do that and are still gonna make this happen, then you put, 
submit what you can. Chances are it'll work out fine if you put the effort in. And if for some reason they don't accept it, you can find out why not and fix it from there. After you get your notice of approval, you have 180 days to complete the project. Once you complete your project, you're gonna upload photos of that completed project and then request your rebate. Rebates over $600 will be taxed. That's critical. It's just a federal law for uh, federal income tax. You are going to get, I believe it's a 1099 form, if I'm remembering correctly. So if you take out your 5,000 square feet of turf, if you have that much, and you get your $10,000 or $15,000 rebate check, remember that you're going to owe federal taxes on anything over $600. Still a good deal, but you don't want to get surprised by that. You will get that tax documentation at the end of the year. And so this is just an example from my front yard. When you send in pictures, they need to have a little bit of your house or your driveway or your garage or something, not a close up of the turf. And this is what my yard looked like when I applied pretty brown, but you can see that it's still there. You know, if I started watering uh, to some degree, it would green back up. And so that's acceptable. So a couple of questions that came in from Igor. In your example with gravel on the patio, how can we keep that weed free? Would you please advise? Depends on your site, but what a lot of people will do is on top of the, the soil underneath the gravel, they'll put in a permeable uh, ground cloth or a weed barrier. The higher quality ones are going to be available from your local landscape supply store, not necessarily the stuff at Home Depot. You can also generally get much wider sheets so there's less overlaps at the landscape design store. Uh, comes in a roll and that provides a weed barrier. Uh, and from Deborah, have you heard of the Footpaths to Food Paths Initiative Walkway with Edible Landscapes? Have you incorporated perennial edible plants in front yard landscape designs? Absolutely, uh, I do that pretty commonly. So I showed you my parents' backyard. The front yard is a mostly native and Mediterranean front yard, but there's also a pomegranate, a uh, grapefruit, a dwarf grapefruit and a dwarf mandarin orange in the front yard and working with drip irrigation. So you can provide just to the area of the fruit tree, a medium water use amount, and then depending on your fruit tree or high, and then uh, Everywhere else you can provide lower water is a great way to intermix those things and still have a productive landscape. So you can absolutely accomplish that and drip irrigation because you can really uh, affect where you're, you're adding how much water really helps make that into a lovely edible landscape if you want. But yeah, I've, I've been involved with projects where we've done raised vegetable beds in front yards, you know, whatever you can think of. And all of those would be uh, rebatable as well, as long as the turf is coming out, if you live in that uh, potential area for the turf removal rebate. And so the stormwater retention feature, this is a requirement for the rebate, but even if you are not gonna be doing the rebate, in 2021, every landscape, no matter where you are, no matter if you are somewhere where water is scarce and so you wanna hold on to it, or you're somewhere where there's a lot of water and so areas flood and water quality is a concern during rain events, you're gonna to wanna to think about, is there a way if you're renovating your landscape that you can hold on to some of the rainfall that you might not otherwise when it comes down? For the rebate program, a rain barrel is technically an option if you have gutters all the way around your house, but it's normally not your best solution. If you're passionate about rain barrels and you really wanna go for it, then by all means do it. But what most people find out when they put in a rain barrel, average rain barrel holds 55, 60 gallons of water, even if you put in a couple of them and you have 100 gallons of water storage capacity. If you have a one inch rain event falling on 1000 square feet of roof surface area, that will generate approximately 620 gallons of water. So your rain barrel is gonna fill up in a snap. Conversely, even in your water-wise landscape, most low water California native landscapes, to keep them from going really dormant in the summer, even though maybe they could survive that, most gardeners, even when they're thinking about conservation, are going to provide one inch of water in terms of irrigation to that landscape per month in the months that it doesn't rain to keep things looking good. And that's still a low water landscape. 
To provide one inch of water over a 1,000 square foot landscape, same math, requires 620 gallons of water. We actually pay from our like city connection to the water very, very little per gallon of water. So even if our water bill feels expensive, it's because most people have no idea how many gallons of water they're actually using. And so you can see that if we get in Southern California, rain a few times in the winter, where we don't really need to water our landscapes much and it fills up those rain barrels. And then we're needing to, the first time we water our landscape, provide that much in terms of gallons of water across our landscape, our rain barrels aren't gonna make a big difference. If you have uh, like potted plants on your patio using a rain barrel to fill up a watering can and water those uh, plants is what most people have rain barrels do. But in terms of capturing a lot of water for that environmental benefit, really holding water onto the site, most people are much better off with some sort of feature in the landscape, like a dry stream bed being the most common one, that's going to absorb that water and let it soak down into the ground, hydrate both the root zone of your plants, maybe a little bit more than they would be otherwise if you weren't concentrating water there. And eventually that water will trickle down and help recharge the groundwater table over time, which will help preserve your local water supply. So, that being said, what might that look like? So this is a picture of where the system in my front and side and backyard starts for rainwater capture when we redid our landscape. This is it kind of young, it's grown in a, a quite a bit more now. And so water sheets off of our roof. We don't have rain gutters. The eaves of the house are a little bit curved. So it'd be, we'd have to do major surgery on the eaves of the house to put in gutters. And so we decided just to accept it. And so water falls off of the roof and basically goes right down into this very shallow kind of dry stream bed. We kind of dug this out and it's just covered in a large gravel with some, some cobblestone, but enough to get the water here. And it very slightly tilts off to the side. So if there's a lot of water, instead of flooding right here, it goes around to the side where in this narrow section where we didn't have a lot of room to work with, with the walkway, we, it converted to what's called a French drain which is basically just a trench. It's about one foot deep, one foot wide, filled with a coarse gravel. It's about an inch and a half to two inch gravel. So there's decent amount of open space in between the rocks, just with how the rocks fill that trench. And so water can move underground. Some of it will soak in here, but if there's a lot, it follows the slope of the walkway, which continues to go down. And then we dug under the walkway and installed a pipe. So it can go around the side of the house and then goes out into the back where we have a lot more room and have a more traditional wider dry stream bed. And so any of these things for the rebate could qualify, even if you just have room for the French drain. If you're using that for small sites, sometimes that's the, the best solution. That's not listed on their approaches, but if you just call it a, uh, a dry stream bed or a dry creek bed, that's gonna qualify as well. As long as it's something in your design that works, they're not gonna get caught up on what you call it, just select what seems like the closest thing to you from the drop-down menu. And so this kind of is just one example of the new approach to thinking about rainwater with your design. Here's kind of the new paradigm. When water falls on your property, and it's especially if it's coming off your roof or in a large amount, you want that water to slow down, to spread out, and that'll help it sink in. And so falling on the gravel and then that water trickling through every little piece of gravel will slow it down as opposed to as it's just falling on soil and starting to run off in a road. It will also help it spread out, whether it's kind of vertically in the French drain or in a wide dry stream bed. And slowing it down and spreading it out allows the soil to have more surface area and more time to let it sink in through the natural ability of the soil to gather water. Helps it out a lot more and you get a lot more capacity to sink that water in than if it was just landing on dirt or on turf. If you are going to have a main large area that accumulates and sinks rainwater in, and you have the room, it's best to choose a space that's going to be at least 10 feet from building foundations. That's gonna be the best thing long-term from your foundation. That being said, for example, my house, when I moved into it, this system solved a flooding issue that looked like it had probably been there since the house was built close to 60 years ago. Uh, 
just because of the way the slope is and the fact that there had never been installed any feature kind of like this. So my foundation happened to be fine, but when I made the final space for all this water to soak in in a big rain event, also taking in the water from the driveway, it was around the back about more than 10 feet away from the house. Little amounts like this uh, should be okay in the vast majority of cases. And so you can see here on the right, once it gets around to the backyard, then we have room to allow it to open up. The landscape has grown in quite a bit more since then, but this gives you a good idea of what we actually had going on, which is a series of dry stream beds and then basins that can overflow. Uh, we have a large property, so we also included that as a feature and a little bridge made out of broken concrete over it. And that also takes all the water from the roof headed to the backyard, as well as the existing concrete patio from the back, and lets us hold it all onto the site. And so how to figure that out starts with observation. Look at your yard. And it can be pretty simple. Where does your water come from? Is it mostly coming from your roof? Is it coming down the driveway? Is it coming from the neighbor's property? How much water is it? Is it just a little bit that's gonna be easy to deal with? Or like I had, do you have major kind of flooding or erosion issues already where you're gonna really want to try to accommodate a lot of water that's maybe headed towards your house or your garage or somewhere where there already are issues? How does it already move through the property? Is there already a low point in your existing landscape or your existing lawn that naturally captures water? Sometimes I've worked with people where there's already a natural kind of divot and a low point. And as the turf comes out, all we need to do is kind of accentuate that low point and maybe work in some rocks, some plants that can take some seasonal flooding. And the site's already set up for that. Sometimes that doesn't exist at all. And you need to create that. So where does it naturally end up? If it naturally ends up somewhere that can become a, a dug out basin, then the tough work might already be partially done for you. So think through all of these things. We do have online at our uh, YouTube playlist, cbwcd.org slash YouTube. For those of you who have joined us recently and didn't see the first slide, I will type that in, cbwcd.org slash YouTube. which I just typed into the chat, that will get you directly to our YouTube playlist. And on there, we have a whole three hour workshop called Rainwater Harvesting for Home Gardens, where I go through this process and I show you a step-by-step -step example and many other slides and examples of really how to figure this out. So I definitely highly recommend if you're thinking about doing this at home to take the time to uh, watch that workshop at your convenience and you'll really get a lot more detail out of it of, of how to start to approach that. But in this workshop, I, we have time to provide one other example. This is from a home in the San Gabriel Valley, Pasadena, California, where they used to have flooding issues in their basement and they had sump pumps that would sometimes fail uh, because there'd be a lot of water coming from the backyard, which was a little upslope. And so here's part of the solution. Here you can see a normal just downspout, that slow spread sink, and so first that downspout hit a piece of concrete. So instead of eroding water or sorry, soil and mulch from the landscape area, it gets hit, dissipates some of that velocity initially and gets kicked into this slightly wider French drain. So a trench filled with the porous gravel and cobble. And I really like how the designer integrated recycled old terracotta roofing tiles as edging with some young native plants around the edge. Here you can see they went as far as to saw out sections of the driveway headed towards the street as well, which is beautiful. Uh, not often done, but that was cool to see. But this main feature then allows a little of the water to, to trickle in. But if there's a lot of water, it's gonna to continue to follow the main slope of the general land area around the side. Most existing concrete walks, if they're in decent shape, can take a small hole or tunnel being dug underneath without cracking or being compromised. And oftentimes a pipe will be put in to prevent any additional soil erosion. So going underneath the existing walk around the house out to the side where there's a wider area which can allow more water to soak in. But if there's a huge storm event and there's more water than this system can handle, now this feature is all the way around the side of the house if the water level rises, it can then already slow down, already spread out quite a bit, can soak through 
the existing planted landscape, which helps slow it down and, and soak more water in through the mulches. And if there is a huge storm event, just goes out to the curb where the water can be headed without causing any property damage or any issues with the flooding on the property uh, anyways. And so this very naturalistic wildflower meadow with some native shrubs may or may not be the style that you personally like, but the concepts can work with any landscape, formal, informal, anything in between. Here's a few other pictures of just approaches that people have used to use this, but it can also be a garden feature. It can look quite nice, flanked with plants. And a quick tip is usually the best looking dry stream beds and infiltration basins like this work with the stone that is native to that area. So down here in Southern California, that's usually a granite type mix of cobble and gravels that are gonna be in these wide variety of gray tones. So it's a lot of really cool looking rock, but the reason why I recommend you working with local materials is threefold. One, that's gonna have the least environmental impact because it's not stuff being trucked from across the country or sometimes out of the country or from another state uh, on big diesel trucks to get rock into your garden. It's, it's gonna be transported from relatively locally. Second reason is aesthetically, the local material is generally going to be where you can find the widest range of sizes. So you can have everything from small boulders to cobblestones to gravels, and it will all match and look natural together. Usually the imported rocks, you can't get small boulders, cobble, and gravel that are all similar. Normally it's kind of only one size. And when you put that out into a landscape feature, it starts to look very artificial. And then uh, finally, it's usually the cheapest. So for example, this kind of stone, which is, is quite nice and this kind of gravel is usually about a third of the cost per pound, which is how gravels and cobbles are, are, uh, are charged with the gravel. Sometimes it's by scoop with a tractor, but usually they're about a third of the cost than a more exotic quote ornamental gravel or cobble, which doesn't look better out in the landscape in my opinion. And so here's just another example, uh, driveway that the street is upslope, water goes towards the garage. And by providing this outlet into this slightly lower dry stream bed, the water can go safely away from the garage, soak in. And if there's a lot of water can go up to this young planted area in the garden where the worst that could happen is some, some wood chip gets washed around in a big storm event. So much safer than having the water all head towards the garage. So that in a nutshell is how to think about capturing some water on your property for most of us. And you can check out that full rainwater harvesting for home landscapes workshop at cbwcd.org slash YouTube. And so I haven't seen any new questions coming in. So we're gonna keep it moving along because we still have a lot to cover. And we'll start to talk about choosing plants. So now you maybe have thought about your goals You've thought about things that might affect where you have room to put plants, like if you need to put a dry stream bed through part of your yard, and that can also become a beautiful feature that helps kind of organize and set off the look of the plants that will surround it. And so now we're going to think about choosing plants. And that's a process of research, but it should be very fun and exciting because you're thinking about these beautiful plants that maybe are plants that are gonna provide for food for songbirds or butterflies. And you're gonna be bringing in them into your landscape space and living and growing with them and seeing them flower every year. As you do the research, what happens to a lot of people, whether they're plant lovers or thinking about this for the first time, is you might fall in love with a bunch of plants. This is when you need to remember that for most of you, you want to keep it simple. You don't want to fall in love with a hundred different plants and put in one of this and one of that and one of this and one of that and one of this and one of that. Unless you are already a seasoned horticulturist and you that's a plant collection is your goal. It is a lot more difficult to create a sense of design and a nice balanced look if you're planting a lot of onesies. In general, for most people I work with who are people who want to have a lovely landscape, they want it to be relatively simple to maintain, and 
they're either hiring a gardener who they will talk about how to maintain this new type of landscape or they're gonna do the maintenance themselves. But they, in general, most of the people I work with aren't wanting to become people who like, one of the main things they identify themselves as is I'm a gardener. They just wanna have a nice landscape. If that is you, don't put in too many different plants and definitely don't put in too many different plants and crowd them. Remember, you need to keep in, in mind how big they're going to get. For most people I work with in a suburban front yard or backyard, you're somewhere between 10 and 20 different types of plants total, including trees, shrubs, and ground covers, sometimes less. With five very carefully selected different plants, you can repeat them and use them in masses and still have an extremely lovely landscape. You don't need 72 different kinds of plants unless that's really your goal, in which case uh, be careful and don't take on too much at once. And so here's the big idea with plants. You want to put the right plant in the right place. I would say when we're working with plants that are relatively tough, native and water-wise plants, that in general are going to, if they're selected carefully, want to grow where you put them. It's not like vegetables where they need a lot of fertility and water. You're trying to choose plants that are already adapted to where you are. If you put the right plant in the right place by matching the plants to the soil and site conditions that already exist, you will be setting yourself up for success. 80% of, of success with gardening is probably putting the right plant in the right place and then it's planting well and maintenance. But if you don't put the right plant in the right place, no matter how well you plant it or how carefully you maintain it, you're not gonna be setting yourself up for success. Uh, Deborah just typed in, what about compact soil? If you have very compact soil, you have a couple of options. If it is feasible for you to physically dig that compact soil and loosen it up some, Definitely, you know, it's worth it. But I do work with a lot of people who that's just not necessarily going to happen. And so if you have compact soil, uh, mulching with wood chip mulch over time as that breaks down can bring life back to the soil. I've had that work wonders on compact soil over a few years. But what I'm going to mention is you're going to want to check your drainage. If you have slowly draining soil, whether it's because it's naturally a heavy clay soil where the natural soil properties are slow drainage, or if it's compact, so it's draining slowly, essentially that's creating a condition where it's almost like a clay soil type, you are going to want to work with plants that are naturally adapted to clay soil do some research for your area. If your area is Southern California, I'm going to share a resource with you that will help you make that selection. And make sure you plant your plants a little bit high, an inch or two, and mound up to them. And that will give you your plants the best uh, potential for success. You can also try spreading a thin layer of compost on top. Sometimes that helps kind of jolt the soil biology back to life, which is what's going to help naturally loosen that soil over time. So that is one part of the selection of matching the plants to soil and site conditions. You might be asking yourself now, how do I know if I have slowly draining soil? Well, you can do a simple drainage test that's basically about digging a hole, filling that hole with water a few times to make sure all the soil around it is wet, and then filling it a third time and timing how quickly the soil drains out. We don't really have time to walk you through that whole process in this workshop, but we go through that whole process step by step, which is not that complicated, in another workshop, which if you're going to be taking on this project yourself, and especially if you're going to be installing it, is worth watching as well. That workshop is called Choosing, Purchasing, and Planting Waterwise and California Native Plants. It's on our YouTube page. And at approximately 12 minutes in, a little bit after that, I go through step-by-step step and show pictures about how to do a drainage test. It's not a huge hole. You dig, it's about a foot by a foot by a foot, and then you time it. And basically, if over averaging out as that water goes down through that hole, after all the soil around it has already been pre-moistened, if the, so the water drains out two inches per hour or more, you have pretty well-drained soil. You can plant plants that want well-drained soil. Between one and two inches, 
kind of mixed. You might be able to get away with it, but you're going to want to put your plants a little high. And if you get a huge series of storms, a few of those plants might suffer a bit. Uh, if your drainage is less than one inch per hour, you have heavy clay or compact soil and you don't have good drainage, which is okay. You just need to make sure minimally that you're working with plants that are adapted to clay soil and maybe plant a little bit high as well. In that choosing, purchasing, and planting water-wise in California native plants, later on in that workshop, there's also demonstrations of proper planting techniques for water-wise plants, including how talking about how to plant those plants a little bit high, what exactly I'm talking about. And then size is another huge issue. How wide is that plant gonna get? How tall is that plant gonna get? Oftentimes people will plant plants too close together not seriously thinking that that plant that says it's going to get six feet, wide, six feet wide is going to get six feet wide, especially sometimes it happens within a year or two. And planting plants that are going to get wide too close to a path, a sidewalk, or the edge of the landscape. Read those labels, do that online research, really take that into account and assume that they will get that big. If it seems like things are too far, far apart, Maybe just sprinkle a few uh, the next fall, a few uh, native wildflower seeds native to your area in between. So you can get a little bit of fill and color in between, but you're not going to have to take out big woody plants because sometimes people overplant and tell themselves, I'm going to get back to it later and remove plants here or there. Nobody ever does that on time. So if you put too many plants too close together, they'll grow over each other. It plants keep won't look as nice and it'll be a lot harder to maintain as well. You won't have as good air circulation, which could promote disease. And then finally, uh, but very important, sun and shade. If your plants that you're researching say they want full sun, that is throughout most of the year, six or more hours of direct sunlight. So it doesn't need to be full blasting sun, sun up to sundown. Six or more hours of direct sunlight is considered full sun. Part shade is either dappled overhead shade or might be like morning sun and afternoon shade. And then plants in hot, dry areas like Southern California that want shade really mean like no direct summer sunshine or those plants could fry. So that's a general, uh, general guide. A lot of our water-wise plants really like full sun or close to it. And so if really that plant requires full sun and can't take part shade, and you have a lot of existing tree canopy, make sure you choose plants that can take part shade to keep everything happy and healthy, set yourself up for success. For those of you in Southern California or also in some other hot, dry areas, we have resources to help with plant choices. The main one that I recommend is the Inland Valley Garden Planner. That's a website that we created to help people with choosing plants for Southern California, but it's applicable to a lot of uh, other hot, dry climates. People use it all over the world. And we, I also have, for those of you in California, Favorite Plants for Inland Valley Gardens is one of our online workshops on our YouTube page. Those favorite plants were developed specifically for plants that can take that hot summer heat of inland Southern California. But if you're more kind of in a moderate zone or on the coast, all those plants are gonna work as well. Uh, you just might be able to get away with watering some of them less or put some of the part shade ones in a little more sun. And then I'll also talk for those of you in our local area a little bit about a residential landscape design assistance program. I wanna do a very quick demo of the Inland Valley Garden Planner just to show it to you. That's at inlandvalleygardenplanner.org. And we have a few features. If choosing your plants seems quite overwhelming to you and figuring out how to put them together. We have a section called Garden Styles, which has around different themes, pre-created plant lists. So for example, if you're interested in a butterfly and songbird garden, you can go here and it's a plant palette already created, which has a description of what you'll get with it and we keep it pretty simple. Recommendation for a top tree. Some of them have two or three trees to choose from. And then top shrubs, perennials, and a grass. And 
doesn't mean you can only plant these plants, but this gives you a good kind of pre-coordinated place to start and choose. And then if you want to choose some other plants whose characteristics match uh, in terms of their water use and you know that right plant, right place factors, you can go from there. And then we also talk about the irrigation that they're going to need for inland Southern California. So if you're somewhere else, that might change, be a little bit different, but that's the plant palettes. We are also currently working on and hope to have up before the end of the summer, a major build out of this with a lot more information and a lot more imagery and ideas basically about how to turn this from a plant list to your own garden design based on a lot of examples. So if you sign up for our newsletter, you'll definitely get notification of when that is active on our website. But the main heart of this is the plant finder, which has detailed profiles of over 350 plants, all appropriate for inland Southern California. And so for example, you can search if you know that you want a shrub, that maybe is California native, low water, it's a full sun area. So that gets from 350 down to 52 plants. And then maybe there's something special that you want. Like maybe your area is clay. Now it's 31 plants. And maybe you want it to be a bird or wildlife plant. Uh, that only eliminated one, down to 30. But still from 350, these are going to be our top selections of plants that are going to have great qualities. They're going to be achievable or maintainable for most gardeners in Southern California. Some native plants, not all, but some native plants can be kind of tricky with the watering. These are going to be our top choices that most people can be successful with. And then you can start looking at what they look like or looking at other characteristics of size. So each of these has their own profile. So for example, Toyon, you'll find out is going to be a 15 to 20 foot shrub where brittle bush is going to be a four to maybe five foot wide shrub. And so for each of these plants, you get pictures of what it does, the own, your own plant description, water needs, so you know how to match it with other plants and irrigate it. And then those plant properties to help you with right plant, right place, including height and width, flower season, the soil adaptations, and exposure, which will also tell you about the sun and then other information. And then once you plant these plants, you're gonna to need to know either how to maintain them or how to tell your gardener landscaper if you employ someone uh, to maintain them. And so each of these has its own maintenance entry. It's quite simple and most of these plants are low maintenance and only need to be uh, touched or trimmed uh, once, no more than twice a year but knowing what season to do it and how much to do is very important. So we have that for each plant. So I encourage you to check it out and explore more. That's the Inland Valley Garden Planner. So now back to the workshop. For those of you within our local area that we directly serve, and that's if you get your water from Chino, Chino Hills, Cucamonga Valley Water District, Monta Vista Water District, Ontario, Fontana, or Upland, you can qualify for our residential landscape design assistance program in which we will actually, our staff will create a design for either your front yard or your backyard. It's no cost for the service, but we do require a $100 refundable deposit. And then after you get your design, if within a year you install that or a similar landscape, you can make some changes to it, whatever's going to work for you, but you install a water-wise landscape in that space, we are very happy to refund the deposit. That's just to make sure that people are serious in doing the project because we spend a lot of staff time creating these landscape designs. You'll choose a style from one of these top eight styles or themes, which seems to work for pretty much everybody as a starting point. And then we will add in plants as we need to. If for some reason, one of the none of these styles appeal to you, we'll work with you on creating something that will work. And we'll get in touch with you and tell you exactly what you need, but you'll send us measurements of your yard so we can create a base plan, photos of your site, and then we'll use Zoom to have an online screen sharing meeting where we design your yard. So there's a lot more details about the program, but you can get that at cbwcd.org slash design assistance. That's cbwcd.org slash design assistance. The one other requirement is that you participate in this workshop before you sign up. So you will all have uh, met that requirement as well.
And so here is just an example of one of the front yard, mostly California native with some succulents mixed in landscapes that we designed for some of our participants. And I just saw some pictures that they sent me uh, two days ago and it is in and starting to grow in beautifully. Quick question that came in from Nick. Is there a section on the website for plants that are good at supporting slopes? Yes, there is. There is a section where it says helpful lists. And one of those lists is plants that are good on slopes. Great question. Uh, okay, so next to touch on is construction planning. First thing is make sure you consider it. Is it gonna be all at once? Is it going to be in phases? Or you, if you're doing the work yourself, is it going to be a bit at a time when you find the time? Any of those are fine, but kind of think about that before you start doing the work. If you can, plan to plant in the best season, which in California and in most Mediterranean climates, mid to late fall is absolutely the best. Think sweet spot is Thanksgiving through Christmas or New Year, a little bit into the New Year. Uh, that sort of phase. Planting in the late fall, it might still be hot during the day, but the days are much less longer or are much less long. So it's less total heat than in the summer for sure. And when you plant in the mid to late fall, there's still enough warmth that it might stimulate some growth. But then as it goes into winter, some plants are just going to take off right away. Some plants, you won't see a lot of growth on the top, but they'll be rooting in and kind of starting to get established. And then when the heat hits in the spring, kind of April, the next year, really they're ready to go. They're, they're starting to be rooted in and they can support all of that top growth. And if there is an early heat wave, like we often get, having been planted in the fall or winter is going to help them be rooted in enough to help handle that early stress. Summer is never good, a good time for planting water-wise plants. Some like cactus and succulent can handle it. But for the, the gardens that most of you are gonna be thinking about, summer is a good time for contemplating design. It's the best time for killing turf. You can prepare your irrigation and then be ready to plant in the fall. Work with your budget. Think about what your budget's gonna be and adjust your design and phasing as necessary. And if you're working with a contractor, absolutely bring them in early both to start to get a handle on costs, but also good contractors are busy these days. There's a lot of demand for people working on landscape projects. Uh, the COVID and so many people being stuck at home more has really uh, been great for the landscape industry, but good contractors are quite busy these days. So plan on bringing your contractor in early, talking to them, and if you select a contractor, getting on their schedule to ideally do this work in the best time of the year. If you're working with the contractor, make sure that you talk to at least three contractors, get three bids and compare them. Sometimes the prices might be all over the place. Make sure you ask for them to put down as much detail as possible what exactly they're gonna do, because sometimes something that's a little bit more, you're going to be actually uh, paying more, but you're going to be getting a lot more out of it. If one of the bids comes in way lower than the other ones, that's not necessarily the best deal. Sometimes that's the person without really a good understanding of what you're asking them to do, or maybe they don't have the experience to know everything that the project's going to entail. Sometimes the person with the very low bid is going to be the person that's going to come back to you halfway through the project asking for more money. So whoever you select, maybe it's the lowest bid, but it might not be. Uh, you are going to want to, before signing a contract with them, ask for references of similar sized projects that they've done in the last few years. Call those references, make sure that they're happy with both the end result as well as the professionalism of the contractor. And they should also be able to provide you with you know, pictures of other similar landscapes that they've done to make sure that you're really choosing someone who you're going to invest the time and the, the expense with to really help you have a great project. In California, California contractor code states that any project over $500 of combined materials and labor should be done by a licensed contractor. Licensed contractor can share their number with you and you can look that up with the state contractor's license board 
and there's a function where you can type it in online, make sure that contractor is in fact in good standing. And that also protects you because a licensed contractor needs to carry all the liability insurance. So if one of their workers gets hurt working on your property, you are not at risk. That's part of what you're paying a contractor for. They might be a little bit more expensive, but you are generally paying for experience, the certification and the insurance. Just because they're licensed doesn't mean they're the best at doing what they do. That's why you ask for references, uh, but those are the things that you should be thinking about. And so in terms of cost, here's what we've been seeing lately in our area for local projects, either a front yard or a backyard that include removing the turf and installing a new landscape, which usually includes turf removal, plants, mulch, a simple something like a dry stream bed, uh, as well as not necessarily doing the whole irrigation system from scratch, but capping off most of the sprinklers and maybe converting using the pipe underground and then converting to drip irrigation that's going to be run through the landscape, for example. Uh, do it yourself projects. If you're doing the removal, planting, irrigation, mulching, you can often do that within that $3 per square foot, like local uh, rebate budget, maybe even a little bit less depending on what you're taking on. If you're hiring a contractor for projects that include removal of the turf, plants, adapting existing irrigation, mulch, and modest water capture, we're seeing, depending on different factors and depending on the contractor, $3 to $9 a square foot. Thinking six to nine is probably the most reasonable. I've, I've worked with a few people who they've had contractors that they were happy with that were able to do it just right at that $3 uh, rebate expense, but I would not expect that. That's kind of pretty rare. Uh, if you're thinking about all of the above, plus maybe, for example, uh, we did a design on a project where then the homeowner also had the contractor demolish an existing uh, concrete walkway that went from the sidewalk to the house, replaced it with a flagstone path, some boulders, some landscape lighting. Uh, and it was not a wood chip mulch, but more of a decomposed granite and gravel mulch. So something that's gonna be more expensive at the outset. That project, for example, came in at $12 a square foot. So if you end up going with things that are more ornate or if you are planting larger plant material, it could definitely go up from there. But that's sort of what we've been seeing lately with some of the people who have gone through our landscape design program and then have worked with local contractors for the installation. You don't need to plant things large. Unless you have a reason to plant larger, most plants plant it just from a one gallon plant, which is the standard small size. Uh, sometimes trees you can only find in a five or a few species only a 15 gallon pot, uh, but those would be the only reasons to go, go larger. Uh, other than that, for my personal gardens, I always plant everything one gallon. Those plants are not only a lot cheaper and easier to plant, but they tend to grow faster and have the strongest root systems over time. So a few years down the road, sometimes those plants planted as one gallons are going to be a lot bigger than the plants that were planted from a much larger size and that cost a lot more. And so all of this can depend on many factors, your site, conditions, how your existing irrigation is set up, front yard, backyard access, lots of those sorts of things. So that's why you need to get multiple quotes and uh, go from there. So what we're gonna do from here is give you an example of bringing it together in a design. The example is gonna be my front yard. And then we will talk a bit about needing to remove turf, different techniques for that, and irrigation. And I'm also going to share with you for both of those, uh, we have a full workshop. So if you're going to take it on, I'll, I'll mention the titles of those workshops that you can check out on our YouTube video. Because in this two and a half hours, I can't turn you into an expert on everything, but really I'm trying to give you a good baseline of things to think about and then know where to go for the next level of resources. Did mention as I was talking about mulch, uh, had some comments come in probably from someone who is in an urban wildland interface area. If you are someone who is in an urban wildland interface area where wildfire is a concern and it's starting to be a concern every single year, there are also lots of resources available that go beyond what I can talk about tonight uh, about firescaping or landscaping for fire. Uh, 
A lot of the plant choices we have on Inland Valley Garden Planner will be great for that, but there are definitely lists you can get for your areas of plants to avoid. Uh, the plant density is going to be of a concern, making sure you have plants that might be low water, but then can take a, a wash down if it's like a red flag warning. And then when it comes to covering the area uh, with mulch, where in certain areas, kind of in the suburbs or in the cities, we might use a wood chip mulch in some of those fire areas, especially around the house, you will want to work with inorganic materials that can't catch on fire. So thank you very much for mentioning that, Deborah. For those of you in those areas, those are good things to consider. And I encourage you to talk with your local fire district and find out what resources for your specific area are available if that is a concern. And then you can mix those general fire guides with uh, the other concepts that we're talking about tonight. So this is the house where my partner and I live now. We're gonna be talking about our front yard, which we put in a couple of years ago now using that turf removal rebate program. And you can see we are on a cul-de-sac, uh, not a tiny front yard, but not big at all necessarily. And it feels kind of smaller, at least it did when it was turf, than it actually is. It's about 1200 square feet of planting area. And you can see how the houses are angled. So there's a lot of houses on this relatively small cul-de-sac facing each other. It's kind of like a bit of a fishbowl. And so here's our driveway. Here's our neighbor's driveway. Uh, they just have a gravel strip right here. Here's our other neighbor's lawn. And the way the houses face each other, a lot of the windows face each other as well. And so starting a design, the first thing I always do is a basic sketch. And you can do it in whatever way is going to appeal to you. Sometimes just to get my ideas down, what I'll do is I will pull up uh, on Google Maps or Google Earth, the property, I'll zoom in, I'll put it on the aerial photo view, and I'll just do a freehand sketch, roughly trying to get the sizes right, but not necessarily worrying about measuring it out on graph paper yet or doing it to scale. If you wanna measure it out, do it to scale on graph paper, that's awesome. But if you're just one of the peop those people who will not do that, if that seems intimidating, you don't need to worry about it, especially at this phase. Roughly kind of draw it out. Normally I'll draw it on scratch paper and the first time it will be totally wrong, I'll throw it out. By the third time I'm doing it, things will be close enough to get my ideas down. Uh, what you can also do is you could print out uh, just the, the photo from Google Maps or Google Earth and then use tracing paper over it to get your ideas down, uh, whatever's gonna work. Or sometimes people will print it out and then use a marker to kind of go over the larger shapes that are gonna be relevant for the boundary areas. Whatever's gonna work for you to get your ideas down. I will also either on that piece of paper or sometimes on another piece of paper, but I will make sure I keep it close to me is write down my list of goals. Because as you get going on the design, it's easy to lose track of your goals, especially as you're starting to think about plants and other things like that. Keeping it close, you can constantly review it. And then on your base plan, it's really the most important things. So for us, driveway, boundary of the planting area, we happened to notice that when our water meter was replaced, it was put in only about six inches deep. So that became important because if we're gonna be putting in a dry stream bed or something, we need to make sure that our water main which is what I meant, the water main is only six inches deep, uh, you know, that, that needs to not be sticking out of the ground. Uh, neighbor's gravel strip. And then on the house, it's important to note where all of your windows are, because as you design, you're gonna be thinking about the views from inside the house out, as well as what it looks like outside. You don't wanna miss opportunities to frame beautiful views from inside your house. I'll also make sure I capture the ridge lines of the house, because that's going to help me track where the water is falling as I kind of go into my analysis. And so that's basically the base plan. If you're doing it on paper, once you have your base plan, uh, make photocopies or scan it. And then also you might be working on layers of tracing paper over it. You don't wanna to have to redraw the base plan every time you make changes to your ideas because they will change a lot. From there, you're gonna go into a site analysis, which is just a fancy way of saying, putting down your observations. Observe for as long as it takes. If you just have moved into the house, make sure you spend some time uh, taking a look at things. Don't rush right into coming up with a design because you might miss some things that later on you would think uh, should have been obvious and maybe you wished you had noticed. So you're gonna be thinking about what areas are sunny, what areas are shady, what areas are sunny part of the year and then shady part of the year, noting that all down. Your soil and drainage rate, we talked about doing that drainage test, so you want to take that into account. 
views. You might want to keep reviews, you might want to block. For example, uh, do you have a good view of the local mountains from a window or an area of your yard that you want to keep open? Then you're going to need to be thinking about the sizes of the trees and the shrubs and where they align to preserve that view or maybe even emphasize that view. Or did your neighbor build a second story addition that now stares down into your yard and you're wanting some tall shrubs that are gonna block that view? Also something you can deal with in the design. Water flows, this is a chance to jot down those observations that we talked about in terms of knowing where the water goes to and from and settles on your property. Thinking about microclimates, which is just a fancy word of saying any areas that are particularly hot or cold compared to the rest of your landscape. So for example, in our area, if you have an area that's full sun, gets the full Western afternoon sun, and maybe gets reflected heat from a driveway, that's gonna be a particularly hot microclimate where you need plants that can really thrive in that heat, where maybe 15 feet away in the center of the landscape, you still are gonna want plants that are adapted to our local area, uh, but there might be plants that'll thrive there that would still be a little stressed on that really hot reflected heat area. If you are looking for tips on what plants can really take those weird situations like that, we have a workshop on our YouTube page that favorite plants for Inland Valley Gardens, where I talk specifically about you know, plants that you might use for all sorts of different scenarios, including those hot reflected edges, as well as those funny like north facing areas where it's shady most of the year and then full blasting sun in summer when the sun is high overhead. So you can check out that workshop. Are there noise or other neighbor issues where you might need some screening or maybe you want the sound of like a recirculating water feature to help dampen the noise from the neighborhood? And then existing plants that you want to keep. So for example, I did a design uh, as part of a design consultation program on Monday where the homeowner had two young but have been in the ground for a while and healthy, happy, medium water use trees in the middle of the front yard. And so we don't necessarily want to remove those just because they're medium water use trees, but that's going to be very important to get down on our site analysis. So we know that at least immediately around in the root zone of those trees, we're gonna have a median water zone. And then farther toward the, towards the edges of the landscape working with drip irrigation, we planned for a lower water zone. So we ended up with a native medium water use meadow around those center trees and a drier, combination of colorful native shrubs around the outside to deal with that existing uh, plant needs. And so then you're basically going to just put all of those down in paper, or if you're working on a computer file or however you wanna note it, getting all of those observations down. So for this design, important things were our view of the mountains, the, the area kind of felt a little too open, especially from some of the rooms in the house. We wanted to capture a little bit more privacy, but find a balance to where we are still uh, not really gonna be like putting a, a fence in or a, a full hedge and turning our back to the neighborhood and, and to the neighbors. So kind of screening it off some more, more privacy so it doesn't feel as open, but we'll still having a lovely garden from both outside looking in and inside looking out. Up against the house, this faces north, we had that seasonal, very shady, but then pretty heavy sun in the summer. This whole area flooded, and so we're going to need, like I showed you, to come up with a plan to capture some of that water and also move it elsewhere on the site where we can deal with infiltrating that. And those were the main parts of the site analysis other than checking and making sure we had well-drained soil, which we did, that were going to be important for coming up with our design. And so our design doesn't jump from that necessarily to the detailed planting plan, but going through a series of sketches, and then this ended up being the concept that stuck, and so we moved forward with that, of figuring out kind of how things are going to mass together and feel. And so to accomplish those goals, we decided that we were going to have an informal hedge on the right side, for example, because the view was just of our neighbor's gravel strip and the cars in the driveway because of the wedge-shaped lot. Uh, we caught that view from multiple windows in the house. And so this is an area that we kind of could have, kind of could have a hedge, and that creates a nice dark green backdrop as well for the rest of what's going on in the garden when it's seen from either the driveway 
or the front of the house or even some of the windows because of the angle. And then to capture some privacy but still have enough openness, we decided we have a small deciduous tree that could be multi-trunked. So even when it loses its leaves in winter, there's a, some light screening close to the edge here. And then our living room is here. And that really looking out is something where we wanted to have uh, green instead of the cul-de-sac is just a wide asphalt area. That's mostly what we saw at the time of planting. And so we'd have a small evergreen tree here. And then we decided that even though we wanted it to look lovely from the driveway and the sidewalk, really in the front yard, it's not a social space. We have room for that in the backyard. And that's mostly where we hang out. And so other than walking to and from the driveway, really most of our experience of this front yard space is from the rooms in the house looking out. And so we primarily frame the view from looking out of these windows or maybe standing on the doorstep. And so from there, we worked with smaller plants to a simple meadow around a bird bath, strategically placing the bird bath so that birds coming to it could be seen from these both of these two windows because our cats who are indoor cats, they don't get to go outside and harass the birds that we bring to our, our garden with our plantings, but, uh, but they would be able to see them from both these windows as would we. And then from that, from that meadow, we'd have room for a medium layer of shrubs and ornamental grasses, and then the taller layer building up the view behind it. And so by having that very intentional low from a frame of view, medium, and then taller plants, but strategically leaving and aligning them so we have our mountain view open still, we can also capture a greater sense of depth, an illusion of depth built out into that landscape. And then framing the windows, we put in some shrubs that would get a little bit taller where just a couple of branches might get to the edge of the window. And it makes for more interest from the street looking in up against the house. It's less than beautiful stucco. So that's just fine to have some shrubbery pretty close, but it doesn't really obstruct the views from inside out. And so that's the basic concept before we're even thinking about what uh, plants to put in. And then we also, you can see these little C's. We decided we want to make sure we have little pops of color in some of these corners right at the street as well. Again, for the, the neighbors and just the sense of having a nice garden in the neighborhood. And so after we decide on all this conceptual stuff, then we can start to say, well, with all the situations, with the sun, with what we need for this area, go to the Inland Valley Garden Planner, what plant is going to match those situations, the right size, the right exposure. Uh, we like the look. If we want it to be a plant that's good at attracting birds or butterflies, all of that sort of stuff. And then from all of the plants we can grow in Southern California, or even all of our recommended plants, we can really start to narrow down that list. And so after that, we don't even jump to the final planting design. You can see it starts to be refined, realizing that instead of three shrubs in this middle area, we had room for more. And for our trees and our, our hedge, maybe we figured out our exact plants we're gonna choose. But for other area, I'm still just thinking about lists of plants that are going to be appropriate for all of those conditions in that area. From there, if you are the type of person to draw out your landscape what's called to scale on graph paper. That's great. Take You can take your detailed measurements and then draw it all out so that each square is either one feet or two feet. And from that, you can really draw circles of each of your plants at the right size and know exactly how many plants to order of each species. Currently, if you're planning on doing that, the best resource I know that kind of walks you through that process is created by a group called the Green Gardens Group. And they have the simplest version of their publication, which I really like. It was a project provided for free online by the Los Angeles Department of Water and Power. I created just a quick redirect link. So it's not a lot of letters to type in to get to where you can download that for free. And you can do that at cbwcd.org slash g3 book, like you can see on the screen, cbwcd.org slash g3 book. And you might not even need to do that. It's not necessarily that complicated. Basically, you take all your measurements. I often will just write down all of my measurements, not even trying to do it to scale on graph paper first. And then you can redraw it. And what we find with most uh, suburban lots, front yard or backyard, you're going to want to buy an 11 inch by 17 inch pad of graph paper because an eight and a half by 11 inch often isn't quite large enough. 
And you can easily buy that online or a lot of art supply stores, you'll be able to get an 11 inch by 17 inch uh, pad of graph paper. And what we find the scale that works for a suburban lot is a little bit bigger. So this book mentions, and that's more kind of in Los Angeles formal where the, the lots are a little bit smaller, maybe starting with a quarter inch, which is the size of a typical graph paper square is a quarter inch uh, equals one foot. What we find is an eighth of an inch equaling one foot is what works for most suburban lots that we work on the designs for. And so that would be each square on typical graph paper, that's quarter inch graph paper would be two feet by two feet. But sometimes you can also find graph paper with in lighter grids, uh, that eight, eighth inch grid as well. And so that could be make that easier to use. So from there, you can then start to figure out what you want to do with your water capture if you're doing that, if you're making any changes to walkways, and then start to draw all of your plants to the right size. And then you can make your plant list and know exactly what you are going to need to purchase. Uh, if that is just super intimidating to you and you're not going to do that, that's fine. Uh, you can also go out and maybe with, uh, sometimes people will use those cheap little sprinkler flags, uh, the little little plastic flags on, on a wire that you can get at the landscape supply store. Those you can buy in packs of 100 for something like 10 bucks. And so you can take those out into the landscape. And where you're thinking about putting plants, you can maybe stick that down right with a Sharpie on it, the plant you're thinking about putting there, the size it's going to get, and then get out there with a measuring tape and kind of build out your exact planting plan that way. Uh, that's probably going to take a little bit more redoing. There is an efficiency to doing it on paper, but if that's not your style or and something else appeals to you, do what's going to work for you. So from there, you might get to your final design. And I have to I have to do this a lot. So I work pretty quickly in a computer program. So this was my final design. Yours might look like anything. But what I like doing uh, when I'm drawing it out is basically I have a circle, roughly the mature size of the plant, and then work with the initials of the different plants. In terms of the design process, this is basically where we're going to leave it. I'll show you some pictures of how this landscape grew in. But we have lots more garden design information with California Native Garden Design and Do-It-Yourself Landscape Design classes available on our YouTube page at cbwcd.org slash YouTube. And so just to kind of walk you through what that ended up looking like, you can see here the house when we moved in. This is it when we applied for our rebate. We planted at what I consider the very end of planting season. I love to plant fall through early winter, but with the schedule of when we moved into the house, that just wasn't going to happen. Oh. And uh, so you can see here on March planting day, this was the layout of all the one gallon plants. We planted all one gallon plants, including the trees. Here's our French drain dug out, but without the gravel in it yet. I like to get through my planting first, so I'm not knocking dirt into that gravel. And here is it after we finished planting. So again, doesn't look like much. Uh, this right here, surrounded by rocks, that's one of our trees, barely anything at all. And this is where you have some faith that things will grow in and you did your research and, and your planting plant correctly. From there, there are still some weeds here and there. And so we were going to use to kill the rest of that off a process called sheet mulching, where we're using old cardboard boxes and then wood chip mulch. Huge pile of wood chip mulch. This was also for our very large backyard. So you don't need something this big just to do a yard of this size. And so working, and we'll talk more about this in the turf removal section, working with layers of cardboard as a temporary biodegradable weed barrier to smother the weeds till they're dead and then just break down so that they're not going to cause problems in the long run. The cardboard just kind of becomes compost in place over the course of about a year. So this is it after mulching at about two months. So starting to get some blooms, but everything quite small still. This is our Western redbud tree. This is about two and a half months. We've got the gravel in starting to work with a little bit of cobblestone. starting to grow in a little bit more, still don't really quite see the design yet. 
But in August of that year, uh, had the screen open on a hot day and just kind of noticed, wow, it's it's become a, a garden. You can't necessarily see the whole design yet, but there's there's not just a bunch of wood chip mulch, very different than that view right after planting. You see mostly green. And some of the wider plant spaced plants out here, there's still mulch in between, but starting to get a lot of color. It's beautiful late summer blooms from the California fuchsia. And we got the yard certified as a wildlife habitat, which is something kind of cool that you can do through the National Wildlife Federation, where you self-certify, you just fill out a form where you talk about, and it helps you think through uh, making sure you provide for wildlife food, water, so that could be bird baths and or recirculating water feature, cover and places to raise young. So that's basically having uh, trees or enough dense shrubbery where birds can nest, things like that. And then you can have, get a little sign through that certification process, which comes with like a 20 something dollar donation to them. And that kind of lets the neighbors or the mailman or anyone visiting the yard kind of know what you have going on, especially if uh, it's a little bit more wild of a look than is normally in the landscape. We'll have its own kind of beauty, uh, but this really kind of lets people know uh, what you're up to while supporting a nonprofit that does good work. And it truly is, if you build it, they will come. So August of that year, we had a little female hummingbird move into the front yard. And every morning for like two weeks, I would see her in the morning, just hanging out on this one dried blade of this California fescue grass. And then she'd go hunt some gnats or chase off another hummingbird and come back and rest here. Kind of became my morning friend or companion, even though I saw her from inside the house because she would fuss at me and fly off when I came outside. So getting to enjoy all of that. So that's first year. When you do a whole garden, you always lose a plant or two. So don't beat up on yourself if that happens and learn. Maybe it's just uh, something freak happened, but maybe it's not the right plant for the right place and you could put something in different after that. So at six months, now it's really starting to become a garden. Still a lot of growing to do, but you can see where things are going. Beautiful moments like the sunset manzanita and native deer grass behind it, or the dried flower pods of the native sage with the bird bath in the background. If you are gardening and trying to have wildlife habitat, you know, a lot of people learned about taking care of flowers like from roses or uh, kind of traditional garden perennials where you're told to deadhead, 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 cut the flowers back as soon as the blooms fade so that more flowers come. And on some plants, it will stimulate that. But on our native plants, we do want to make sure we let enough of those seed heads dry out or those flowers dry out so they can actually develop seed because they become bird feeders then. And so I do very little deadheading uh, and let things dry out. They have their own beauty when they do that. And then eventually after all the seeds are gone later in the season, you'll do your seasonal cutback and refresh. And then if you leave some of those, as long as you're not in a fire prone area in that urban wildland interface, but if you leave some of those in our typical urban and suburban yards to become part of the mulch layer, you'll get a whole host of other native birds that will come and pick through those uh, on the ground to try to get the last of the seed from them. So we got another delivery of mulch after this had been planted for about 13 months to do the more of the backyard. And so I was able to climb up on that and take some pictures. So you can see really growing together, starting to have a lot of color. You can see the red bud after only a year and the toyon planted as those tiny one gallon plants growing. Your growth might not be quite as fast. Our soil just happens to be the soil that native plants love. Uh, five minutes down the road at our Waterwise Community Center demonstration garden, things don't grow quite as fast, but they do get going. And so even though there's still a lot of growing to do from the trees and the shrubs, starting to get these wonderful moments of beauty in the landscape. So here is the view to the meadow area with the young hedge in the background in April. And then because we've chosen to have plants that bloom pretty much year round to maximize our wildlife habitat, we also get a lot of color. So here's our spring bloom. And then as that fades, we get a whole other succession of plants in the summer blooming as well. So that's kind of what we can cover on the design. A quick question came in from Jewel. Where were those tree limbs that, uh, what were the tree limbs I used as a border? Uh, so those were, we had some just seedling uh, kind of weed trees, uh, ashes and uh, 
elms will just kind of come up from seed and neglected yards in our local area and that it happened in the large backyard that had been kind of abandoned for many years and they were also they were hazardous they had never been shaped or pruned so unfortunately we had to take some trees out we planted many more native and better habitat trees but instead of sending all of that green waste to just get ground up and turned into mulch we kept all of the branches and stumps and wood sections on the property and then use them in various ways uh, like with edging that also helps provide additional wildlife habitat again useful if you're not in that fire prone urban wildlife interface area could could be extra fire fuel if you were so we are very kind of landlocked in the middle of a suburb far away from the urban wildland interface area so it's appropriate for us and uh and that adds to the habitat value of the yard for sure. So you, something you could find uh, potentially working with local uh, arborists or tree trimmers, especially if they're working in your neighborhood and are having to do some big tree work or tree removals. Uh, not really something you can go to the landscape supply store and buy, but adds a lot of character to the yard. And then, uh, Okay, couple other quick questions, and then we have to jump into for our last half an hour the turf removal and irrigation sections. So, did just want it to uh, make a note to Deborah, who's been typing in many great comments. Uh, all great comments, Deborah. Uh, because we have so little time to cover so much, I don't cover everything related to design in this workshop, uh, but we can cover more of that in our other workshops. But thanks for for the. Uh, the all the uh, input, all good things. And so from Lee, uh, where did we get the delivery of mulch and what was the cost? So for mulch, a couple of things. First, to get deep into mulch, we have a workshop on that called Compost and Mulch for Waterwise Gardens. But quickly, there in the vast majority of areas, uh, there are what are called soil yards, which usually carry soil blends as well as different mulches that you can order uh, mulch from. If you are doing a whole yard, the cost can add up, but that's one option of uh, doing that. And if you are local to our area, on the place where I posted the, si the slides at that cbwcd.org slash presentations, there's also a file you can download of our local landscape suppliers and on their other list of places where you can get mulch. Uh, in addition to that, if you are looking to get free mulch, you can either work with a local tree trimmer, especially if they're trimming a tree in your area and see if they can dump the grinds when they're done. You just wanna make sure it's not like a lot of uh, seeds that are ready to germinate from like a weedy ash tree in it. Or there's also a service online now or an app you can download called Chip Drop, C-H-I-P-D-R-O-P. Basically, uh, if you have a space curbside or in your driveway where you can basically tell local tree trimmers whenever they have it available, if they're in your area, they can dump their full truckload of mulch. So it's gonna be a lot of mulch. Uh, then you can sign up and then you might get mulch the next week. You might get it six weeks out. You might get it 10 weeks out. Just when there's someone in your area kind of connects the tree trimmers with people who want free mulch. And so instead of them paying to bring it to a green waste facility, uh, it's just the stuff that they've ground up doing their tree work and the quality can be variable. They're very upfront. You can see pictures of the different things that you can get and you're going to need to take a lot, uh, but it works out very well for some people who want free mulch because a full load of mulch, if you're not getting it for free, could easily be like $500 if you have a large uh, area to do and getting a full truckload. So the value could be there. So that's chip drop. You can check that out and see if that's right for you. But if you have a lawn, First, you might need to get the lawn out, which is critical. So much of the success or the long-term issues you would have with a turf removal and landscape renovation project are going to be whether or not you do a thorough job killing your lawn. Because the funny things about lawns in hot, dry areas like Southern California is that when you want the lawn to live and be nice and evenly green. It always wants to have patchy dead brown areas. But when you want the entire lawn to just give up and die, it's also always going to have enough stuff always growing back and trying to grow up through the roots and tangled up in your new plants that it's going to be a big pain. 
And the easiest time to deal with it is always going to be before your new plants go in. So if there's one thing that I can relate to you is do a thorough job with the turf removal. Even if your turf is mostly dead, there's a big difference between mostly dead and all dead once you put your new plants in and start doing your establishment watering. Because even though you might be planting low water plants, most of the time you're gonna be doing a good deep soak once a week the first year and then tapering off from there. Even if that once a week is not enough to have that nice even green lawn, it's enough, especially for most of us who have some tough Bermuda grass in our lawns, for that grass to kind of keep going and grow here and there. Uh, because my neighbors have Bermuda grass lawns, I always have a little bit coming up in my front yard. And seasonally, uh, like even right now, I need to go pull a little bit of Bermuda grass out of my front yard, even though I'm only watering like once a month now. So it's just part of it. So first thing that you're going to need to do is identify in general your turf type or weeds that you have. We have a whole class about turf removal techniques, again, at that YouTube page on our workshop channel. And so if you're actually going to be doing this yourself, I really encourage you to check out that workshop or at least the sections with the techniques you're interested in, because it's gonna have way more content than I can cover tonight. And you're going to want all the tips for success uh, that you can take because some of them will save you time and effort. But the main thing you need to do is identify your turf type. That's gonna fall into one of two main categories. Cool season turf, which in our area is usually tall fescue. For example, like Marathon is a common brand, might just be plain old tall fescue. You'll know it because it's green and growing all year long, doesn't brown out in the coldest parts of the winter, and it has the kind of darkest green with these pretty wide uh, leaf blades. If you have all tall fescue grass, it's the most common one that's intentionally planted. If you have all tall fescue grass, it's good news. It's the easiest one to kill because it's the one that least wants to live in a hot, dry area. That's pretty much the only one that you almost could kill by turning the water off for two or three months in the summer and then going from there. But even if you planted tall fescue grass, the vast majority of us in Southern California, whether it's from weed seeds or seeds from the Bermuda grass blowing in from the neighbors, or if you have a gardener that comes and mows your lawn, that lawn mower and the string trimmer equipment is picking up all the seeds from all the lawns that they're mowing. You probably have some Bermuda grass in your lawn. If you have in the coldest parts of the winter lawn that is mostly green and then you get these brown patches even if it's not dry that's probably because it's bermuda grass which if you have a whole area of bermuda grass will go in the coldest parts of the winter usually uh, brown we've had a number of pretty warm winters it's not going to go all brown like this in general but it might brown out some parts of the year it's going dormant it's not dead and it'll come back bermuda grass small blade looks like this. It's the thinner kind of stringier grass that might be mixed in with your other grass. However, it can also, with drought or lack of water, usually go dormant. So it looks dead, but it's just waiting till it gets some water again. And that's the tricky part because Bermuda grass can have a very root, deep root system, could be a foot deep or more. It can have living roots underneath uh, the concrete nearby. And once it gets that water again, like with your establishment watering of your plants, it's gonna try to come back. And that's so much of why we really need to do a good job killing the turf if we have it, even if it's just patchy before putting in our new landscape. Here's some identifiers for Bermuda grass. Here's what it looks like kind of in a patch. Here's what the stolons, which are the stems that creep around the ground look like. And part of why it's so hard to deal with is not only because it can go dormant and come back, but because it can propagate itself and regrow from seeds easily. And those seed heads, if a lawn isn't mowed for like a week or two in the summer, can, can quickly come up and spread. It can propagate itself from stolons, which are basically roots that grow along the soil surface and root back in, or rhizomes, which are, or sorry, the stolons are stems that can root back in, or rhizomes, which are roots that creep, but they all kind of continuously reroot. And so if you, for example, go over the whole area with a rototiller, which you never want to do if you have Bermuda grass and you're trying to kill it, you're just going to chop it up into a thousand pieces, many of which can regrow as new individual plants. 
So we'll talk about techniques that are going to kind of work for that. And then another weed that you might have that will be some extra work to be aware of is nuts edge. You can see it here as the slightly more yellow tinged plant, a little bit wider leaf in the rest of the lawn. A lot of people will have this and not even necessarily know they have it until the lawn comes out and then the nuts edge grows back. So as individual plants, they'll grow in a cluster and start to look like this. They're called nuts edge because you can pull out an individual plant and the roots will leave behind these little uh, kind of rugby or football shaped uh, nuts that then could regrow new plants. And so basically some of the techniques help to knock this back. It does like water. So as you transition to lower and lower water, as your landscape gets established, there'll be less pressure, but you really just want to kind of keep pulling it whenever it comes out and it comes up and you'll eventually you will beat it back. If it goes all the way to flowering, which you never want to let it do, because that means it will have set up many, many, many nuts that can grow back. It almost looks like a little papyrus. So if you happen to see this in your yard and wondering where it came from, that's nut sedge and you want to get rid of it right away or it'll keep spreading. And so here are going to be the main techniques for turf removal, briefly. Method number one, and my go-to, is sheet mulching. Like you saw, that's using corrugated cardboard that you can scrounge, get for free, take some doing, but, uh, but is often available, and using that as a temporary biodegradable weed barrier. And so in this project, uh, the owner of the house actually had a company that installed solar panels, so we had access to solar panel boxes. Uh, which was great. And so you can see here, uh, this, we combined the techniques here. We had a bunch of young people living in a house, so plenty of labor. We're just doing this one side of the yard, so relatively small. So we roughly uh, took out the lawn, but we knew there was going to be enough Bermuda grass roots to come back. So we also did the sheet mulching. And so you can see here, uh, you know, we, we just roughed it out. You can see there's still plenty of, of stuff remaining and then laying down the cardboard. If you have, with any turf or weed type, this technique also works really well if you just have a weedy area. Uh, overlap is essential. Six inches is a minimum if you have Bermuda grass, which can kind of creep and crawl up through overlaps if they're not big enough. I, I go for at least nine inches if I can. And kind of first worked out the path area, then worked out the other areas. Water is key with sheet mulching because it can help lock in good soil moisture uh, before you put that barrier down. So you want to water your area of your landscape really well before you put down the sheet mulch. If you are going to be working with drip irrigation, you need to have your drip irrigation installed underneath that sheet mulch as well, or the, the cardboard layer as well. Then you put down the cardboard, then you water the cardboard well. So you can see how it's wet here and it kind of is slumped down to conform to the shape of the landscape, which it won't do if it's dry. And then from there, you can put your top mulch layer on. So whether that's wood chip mulch in the main landscape area here or a gravel mulch that we did for the pathway. And so from there, if you are using the sheet mulch as your primary way of killing the lawn, which you can do, uh, to smother the lawn. You're going to want to put down your cardboard and your top wood chip or gravel mulch layer eight to ten weeks before you plant so that that grass layer has no access to the sunlight and kind of dies and rots down underneath before you plant. If you are combining it with another technique, either physically removing it, and we'll talk more about that, or solarizing it, then you can plant and do your sheet mulch as your extra sort of insurance policy to make sure a lot doesn't grow back all at the same time. Uh, and then the last thing I will say is if you have Bermuda grass, the reality is that some amount of it's gonna grow back. I mean, any landscape just has some maintenance. Uh, these landscapes are generally much less maintenance than a lawn, but if some of it grows back, you wanna pull it right away because if it keeps growing, it's gonna keep rooting. And so, that's just part of the reality, but this is definitely my go-to technique. If you are not going to be able to accumulate that much cardboard, it is possible to also use this technique with rolls of painter's paper you can get from the hardware store. Places to get that sheet mulch 
or that cardboard, uh, you can talk to local businesses. Bike shops bring in lots of big cardboard boxes and often will set them aside for you. Uh, body shops that are bringing in bumpers and things like that. I've known some people who have gotten them from. Uh, anywhere that gets accumulates large boxes, uh, you can call around and ask and you might be able to get them. Or if you have access to small boxes, you can use lots of small boxes with lots of overlap. So I helped someone with a design who worked at a Starbucks small boxes or medium sized boxes, but in a week she got enough to you know, do her whole front yard. So different ways you can go. If you are also combining this with other techniques like digging out or solarization, or if you have a general weedy area, uh, the paper can work as well. I like to do at least two layers available in the paint section of the big box hardware store. The widest roll you'll get is three feet or a little under. So you're gonna to wanna to get that one because that'll be less overlap than the narrower roll. Make sure you get plain brown, never red. The red has a, a waterproof layer in it, which is great if you spill a bucket of paint on your floor, but not good in your landscape. But the cost, if you're doing a whole yard with this stuff can add up surprisingly quickly. And it's not as effective and doesn't last quite as long as the cardboard. I never recommend the black kind of fabric, but they're really made of plastic weed barriers in landscape areas. Underneath your gravel patio to prevent weeds from growing up, that's okay. But in a landscape area where it's active root zones of plants, these things claim, and at the beginning it's true, that there are perforations in them that uh, allow water and air to permeate. But the reality is, and contractors love them because it's a quick and easy solution. But the reality is that this is what you're generally in for a few years later, especially with wood chip mulch. Uh, the mulch breaks down on the top, which creates a great uh, area for weeds to germinate on top of the weed barrier. So now you're still having to do weeding. The plastic breaks down over time, even the high quality ones. And then in, in, in addition to no longer working is you're pulling out chunks of plastic basically forever from your landscape as it continues to break down. And as it kind of silts up with the broken down mulch, it also clogs those little pores in the weed barrier and cuts off the cycling of uh, organic matter and reduces the ability of air and water to get the roots. So it's bad for plant health, it makes a mess, and after a few years generally doesn't even stop weeds. So it'd be great if it worked in theory, but unfortunately it just does not work long-term. For our next method, solarization. This is basically in the peak of the summer in hot inland areas, you can steam sterilize the top four plus inches of your soil by watering really well ahead of time because you need good soil moisture to really build up that heat. Then laying out clear plastic sheeting from the hardware store and using one or more uh, methods to kind of hold it down tight to the soil. Cause if it's windy and it starts flapping around, you're not gonna generate that heat. So you can use the staples, like that would be used to hold down drip irrigation on edges. You can use probably folded into here is like old two by lumber. You can use it just right on top as well if you need uh, bricks or little nursery pots that hold soil. And if you do that in full sun, in peak summer, so think uh, late June, July, August, for eight to 10 weeks, you will basically fry everything that's alive in the top few inches of the soil. The beneficial soil microorganisms and earthworms generally can travel down and come back up. So it disrupts what's going on from the beneficial soil life, but it can reestablish itself usually pretty well. That's been really studied well because this is a technique also used in organic agriculture sometimes. Uh, but it will not work if it's shady. So example, for this area close to the tree, that area probably won't work that well. And I wouldn't do it, for example, this close to an established shrub because trees and shrubs will have roots that go farther beyond where their canopy ends. And this is gonna fry all of the roots there as well. Uh, pretty effective. Like everything else, Bermuda grass might have some roots that are deeper. And so some of it might come back same thing, you're just gonna have to be on patrol like everything else or combine it maybe with some sheet mulching for extra insurance. And so you might need a hybrid approach like this where you can see the solarization for the areas farther away from the tree. And then they probably use the cardboard mulching with the wood chip mulch on top underneath the tree where there's shade and the root zone. If you're going to be doing this, you're gonna get the clear plastic mulch from hardware store 
and plastic thickness comes in what's called mil. And so four mil or six mil will work. Four mil is kind of the, the ideal balance. It's thick enough that it's gonna last as long as you need it in the sun, but being a little bit thinner than the six mil actually means you can accumulate more heat inside. Needs to be clear, black doesn't work. Black gets hot on the surface, but it doesn't allow that sunlight and that heat to really penetrate down into the soil as well. So that's solarization. So turf removal method number three is digging it up or physical removal. This method works best with either a small yard or lots of young strong backs at home that have plenty of energy. Put your kids to work if they're of that age. Uh, if you have Bermuda grass, you also might generally combine it because some of it will grow back if you try to physically remove it uh, with one of the other techniques. And at that point, often I won't even really bother because I'm gonna rely on the other techniques. But sometimes it is appropriate, especially if you have a small area and you're trying to get it going quickly. If you are physically digging it up, that's gonna be a process of kind of starting somewhere and then working your way back one chunk at a time, generally shaking those chunks out to leave as much of the soil as you can on the site. And then slowly, and often you're digging it up slowly over many weeks anyways, you can kind of green bin it. Some people, and if you have only that tall fescue grass, will rent a sod cutter and basically cut out chunks of sod or rolls of sod. Basically it's a sod process in reverse. And depending on the setting, you can get up to about two inches of soil along with your sod to come up. So if you have Bermuda grass, that's not nearly going to get out enough roots. And it becomes very expensive to, uh, to dump all of this because with the soil, you're basically going to need to rent a low boy dumpster and pay uh, dump fees for that. I calculated it out with the equipment rental and even at that just like two inch cut, uh, a 1000 square foot uh, turf area being removed just down to that two inches in our area is gonna run you up to about uh, $1,600 just in disposal fees. So it can get expensive. And since you can just uh, sheet mulch or solarize anyways, generally I don't recommend the sod cutter unless you have a specific reason to do it. If you have general weeds, but they're very tough weeds, uh, I have heard of people having success, not to prevent the roots from coming back up, but just to cut through and do a once over of every, everything uh, with that sod cutter. I've never done it myself, but I was talking to someone who just did that recently and they had a great success, basically using it as like a, a powered big hoe to cut through everything. And then finally, if you decide to use herbicide, I will say, I don't recommend herbicide as a technique for a number of reasons. The first one is that there's more and more consensus that uh, the main herbicide that people would use, which has long been considered the safest herbicide uh, with the active ingredient of glyphosate, Roundup, but there's many other kind of off-brand names now being sold. Uh, turns out that it, it is probably carcinogenic. There's been a lot of lawsuits over it specifically linking it to lymphoma and multi-billion dollar settlements have been paid out. Uh, we saw headlines like this last June where Bayer, the manufacturer of Roundup, was proposing funding $11 billion worth of settlements as a way to help prevent costs that might go to more than that because there are 30,000 legal claims currently against them. Uh, that I never heard what exactly happened, but it was sounding like that proposal was going to be thrown out because they might be liable for even more than that. So consider it to be something pretty nasty. Uh, I'm going to cover some considerations if you still do decide to use it, because even with that, I still do get people saying, yeah, but I'm going to use it because that's the approach they want. Or if you go to a landscape to supply store or a hardware store and say, I have Bermuda grass, I need to remove, what do you do? This is what they're gonna give you. I'm under a lot of brand names. So I don't recommend it, but if you are going to use it, research and wear proper personal protective equipment, absolutely minimally, long sleeves, gloves, long pants, uh, eye protection. Do not spray when it's breezy or windy. So like in this area, uh, don't spray in the afternoon. It's almost every day is gonna be too breezy or windy. 
one, you're going to breathe more of it, but two, it can carry, the spray can carry on the breeze and it can land on plants you're not targeting. And if it lands on your neighbor's roses, which are very sensitive to the stuff, you're going to have problems. It also might not spray where you're intending it to spray if it's breezy. Know that even if you do it by the book, you use the proper amount for Bermuda grass, you spray it, the exact right conditions. One application is not going to be enough to kill Bermuda grass. And in fact, a normal uh, rotation to really try to get rid of it is going to be spraying it, waiting two weeks, no water hitting it uh, within 48 hours, but then watering to make sure that the Bermuda grass is not going dormant, doing it again two weeks later. For well-established Bermuda grass, you might, not, you might need to do that four times. And eventually some of it is still going to come back, especially if there's Bermuda grass in all your neighbor's lawns, uh, seed's still going to come back. And so there's always going to be some weeding out of it anyways. At that point in time, when you're talking eight weeks or more, you have the amount of time to do solarization. You have the amount of time to do uh, sheet mulching. So there's very little reason I find in most cases for residential situation to really seriously consider using the herbicide. And one more uh one more quick note is if you're going to be taking on the lawn removal yourself, be sure to watch the Removing Your Lawn the Right Way online workshop. From this, if you know what techniques you're interested in, you might be able to click around that YouTube video and not have to watch the whole thing, but there's definitely gonna be good tips and tricks and more information on all of those techniques. And so in our last few minutes, we're gonna talk some about the fact that you're probably gonna need to make changes to your turf irrigation system if you have one, or if you don't have an irrigation system, you might wanna design one from scratch. It is possible in a low water or native landscape to not have a permanent irrigation system at all and either just water with temporary sprinklers or hand water, but that ends up taking a lot of time and it's kind of hard to know if you're doing it all evenly. So if you're dedicated to doing that, by all means you can, but for most people, a good irrigation system is gonna help set them up for success. Your lawn sprinklers will not be able to evenly water your new landscape. They'll normally pop up only two inches or four inches. And in your new kind of diverse landscape with lots of different heights of plant material, normally what'll happen is they'll shoot directly into the side of the closest plant, which will get way too much water and everything else will get way too little water. So to replace that, there's two general good options. Retrofitting your spray system to a high efficiency spray system that's going to be on a taller permanent riser that can spray over the closest plants and into your landscape or installing a grid of drip irrigation that waters the entire root zone. There's also plenty of bad options. This sort of approach to drip irrigation, and I apologize for anyone who already has this approach, is generally what I will always consider a bad option. Just like that weed barrier, this kind of button emitter where you have the larger uh, solid pipe and then the smaller what's called spaghetti tube pipe and then uh, one or two individual little buttons to each plant. In most cases, you're asking for trouble. First reason being, we always see these systems having fallen apart and usually the homeowner doesn't realize. This is an extreme case that we saw uh, on a site visit to a house, but we have a landscape audit program, we call it, where we'll actually go to a homeowner or a business and we'll run every part of the irrigation system and we will notice anything wrong, make recommendations for how timers can be set and ideas for improvements. We have never seen this type of system with the big tube to the small tube or the adapter to the small skinny tube and the individual emitters. Never seen one of those systems that doesn't have multiple leaks. And further than that, when you just have one or two of these at the base of each plant, that's great maybe for the first year when the plants are getting established, but our water-wise plants wanna grow wide, big root systems that can find water where they are. And over time, they actually don't want a bunch of water right at the base. And in theory, you can add more of these emitters and move them farther away, but in practice, nobody ever does that. And so they also don't set up your landscape for success. And so what's the point of an irrigation system if it's not watering the plants where they want to be watered in a way that's gonna keep them healthy? even if these are quick and simple to put together. So aspects of retrofitting a spray system. Basically what I did in my front yard is I took my existing pop-up sprinklers and I went through a process where I connected an adapter to each one, let it 
swing and move over a little bit. So in this case, I just moved it uh, across from where the gravel area was. Some of them could be exactly in the right place. In one area, I needed to add one more, which I can do with an adapter. And then I put them instead of on a pop-up on a solid two foot riser secured with a piece of rebar in the ground. And then a high efficiency spray nozzle, which instead of misting, has a concentrated stream that rotates around. Some streams go farther, some streams stay shorter, and it gets a lot more water where it's going. Working with the design of the plant heights, here the plant heights are gonna stay low enough that it can shoot over them. And on the side where I have shrubs, some of them over time I added another one on or even put a pop-up sprinkler on top of it to shoot taller. And it's true you can see these in the landscape, but you may or may not have noticed them uh, as I was showing you the pictures of it growing in. You don't really notice them once the landscape has grown in. And in fact, some of our songbirds like to perch on them. So it kind of helps support the habitat. It's very low maintenance and very easy to turn on and just make sure everything is still adjusted correctly. So if you have a large area and you have a planting design where the design is not going to block these sprays and as things grow in, you might need to also kind of move them a little bit, uh, which can be done with those same kind of adapters and the flexible pipe, then, uh, then this is a good approach. Sometimes it's easier and almost as efficient as drip irrigation. We have a whole workshop that I will mention in just a minute that really goes into step-by-step -step how to do all of this. This is really just an introduction because it would be impossible to teach you how to actually do all of this uh, amongst all the other topics. Just one quick note though, the way that spray nozzles are meant to be installed is that the center of each one hits the center of the next one. So there's multiple overlaps. This one hits the, this one hits this one. Sometimes we see it set up where just the edges meet and if you look at the soil surface, it'll look like everything got wet, but that's not how these sprays, any sort of, of irrigation spray is designed. It's meant for the overlap to even out the coverage. Uh, if it doesn't have the overlap, it's not gonna be a good even coverage. So retrofitting is a time to fix that if that's the problem. And there's multiple brands of these high efficiency sprays, but you can kind of see the concentrated streams. So that's the general approach. And if you check out the recording of our retrofitting turf irrigation systems, for WaterWise and Native Landscapes. I show you step-by-step step how I did that process. And there's even a supplemental YouTube video that shows me kind of doing that on video, uh, how to replace one sprinkler with that taller riser. If you go with a drip irrigation grid, you're going to be using this kind of drip irrigation where you're purchasing the rolls usually in a 100 or 500 foot roll for a residential project. And the holes you see here are not just holes. They're actually individual emitters that are embedded into here. You're going to be using certain fittings that, that uh, allow you to hit angles or adapt this from being fed from where it used to be a sprinkler. You'll cap off most of your sprinklers and a few of them you'll choose uh, an adapter that will get you onto this sort of pipe that just goes on the soil surface and then is covered in either wood chip or gravel or decomposed granite mulch. And so each one of these are highly engineered emitters so that with a proper pressure reducer and filter before it gets to the drip tube, all of these put out water at the exact same rate. And based on your soil type, you choose them to be a uniform rate at a uniform spacing. And so basically, instead of one or two buttons at the base of each one, you're creating a whole zone which chosen for your soil type. So most common in like a sandy to loamy soil type, you're going to put your your uh, drip lines about 18 inches apart from each other in a small area that you can just kind of weave in and out. And then the emitters are gonna be embedded in the line one foot apart. In a large area, it would look like this. It's literally a grid because if you plant the whole area, the whole thing is gonna be root zone over time. So it's almost as if it rained or it got hit with overhead spray, but it's just all being applied directly to the ground. If you have pathways or other areas, you can kind of skip those. And depending on your size or what you're doing, you can either use a filter and adapter in the locations where a sprinkler used to be, there's kits for that, or you might need to go back to the valve and then go with the larger PVC pipe as what's called a header. And so in that workshop, the Retrofitting Turf Irrigation Systems workshop, available as a recording on our YouTube page, I'm also gonna be teaching it, I think uh, online late summer or early fall, so you can ask questions. You can uh, 
see basically how I went from the original irrigation layout. And I walk you through, including all the calculations for figuring out how much capacity you can have uh, to how to change the locations of these step-by-step step and have those higher sprays. Or if you were gonna do it with a drip conversion and different ways to do that and different options. There's also supplemental videos. You can see step-by-step step how to put that together. Uh, question came in, does the design assistance program also include irrigation design? No, unfortunately, we just don't have the capacity to provide that with the program demand. Uh, but working with the, the workshop materials and we are working with some more information materials that we're working on getting out, uh, people can sort of do their own. Or if you're gonna be working with a contractor, we can guide you in terms of what exactly to tell your contractor you want for the type of irrigation. And so just to finish up for our last slide, get a lot of people who have absorbed all of this information and then they're wondering, okay, what order does it all go into? So what we're gonna do is I'm just gonna run through this slide, 8.30 now. So hopefully some of you have just a couple more minutes. We're gonna run through this slide and then I'll answer any last questions. And I'm gonna ask you to please do just a quick four question, uh, evaluation survey with comments. So I can kind of make sure that this is working for all of you. And if, if there's anything uh, we can improve on, uh, learn from there as well. So what's the order of everything going to be? Remember, you're going to start with your goals. You're going to make your site observations. You're going to think about your budget and then move into coming up with your design. If you're going to be doing the turf replacement application, you have to do that before any work. Immediately, if you're working with contractors, you're also, once you have your design ideas down, talk to multiple contractors get multiple quotes and check references. And then also find out about getting onto that contractor schedule. Remember if you're applying for the turf replacement rebate, it's gonna take a couple of weeks usually to process and get your approval. But if your contractor can't start till the winter, you're gonna to wanna to wait on getting your application in because you only have those 180 days. So you're gonna be figuring out that timing together. Some contractors will also help with design, but you're going to want to at least think through your goals and, and what you're going to want to get before that as well to make sure you're going to really get what you want. From there, you're going to, once you get approved for your application, if you're doing that, kill turf or deal with weeds, uh, prepare the site. If you have to move soil, if you're digging your dry stream bed and maybe using that soil to build some interesting mounds for extra drainage somewhere else, you can do that. If you have that Bermuda grass, uh, ideally done in summer for Bermuda grass or any of those other warm season grasses that we talk more about in the turf removal workshop because it's most active in summer. You wanna be done with and know your turf is dead before you hit like the later fall when it's starting to cool off. Then you're gonna do your main irrigation system work. If you are doing spray irrigation, you're gonna do all of your irrigation system work, have that spray system ready to go before doing any planting. If you're doing the drip grid, you're gonna do most of your irrigation system work but some people, it's optional, will do the final running that flexible tube with the emitters in it at the end. But all of your connections, all of your adapters, any work you need to do at the valve, have that done. So you don't have a lot of downtime between planting and having that finished irrigation system. Then you're gonna do your planting. If you can swing it, that's best done late fall to early winter or definitely by the end of March, if at all possible. Ideally, you never want to uh, plant in the middle of summer you will most likely lose more plants and your other plants might get stressed and grow in slower. Then if you have final irrigation system work to do on your drip, you do that right away as soon as you're done planting. If you need to you know, hand water for a week or so, you can do that, but you wanna get that in as soon as possible. Then you'll do your final mulching, cleanup, final touches, and then you move into establishment care and watching your garden grow in. And so on our YouTube page, we also have classes uh, installation and establishment for native and water wise gardens, essential to learn those tips and techniques if you're going to do it yourself. We have plant selection and planting, it's choosing, uh, choosing and planting water wise and native plants, how to select the healthy plants at the nursery, and detailed planting techniques, how to properly stake a tree if you're going to have a tree growing in, all that sort of stuff. And then we also have a care and maintenance basics class, which will teach you enough basics so that you can read all of that information detailed for each plant on the Inland Valley Garden Planner and know how to take that on. And so with that, thank you very much for staying a couple of minutes extra. It's a lot of information to try to uh, get to you in just two and a half hours to cover all of the basics. 
And please join us for other workshops or sign up for our newsletter or check our YouTube videos to kind of round that out. I have just launched our evaluation poll. So if you can please fill that out. And in addition to that, if you have any comments, we're always trying to improve this. So if there are any things that you learned that you know you're going to put into use right away or that were particularly helpful, we love to hear about those in the chat. That's useful for us to know what's really working well for people to learn about and make sure we always keep that in our presentation. And if there is anything that was unclear or didn't work for you, love to hear that in the chat as well, because I always read it all and we're always trying to uh, teach this information better and develop additional resources to support people and what they're going to need. So thank you very much for filling that out. And I will also then be checking the Q&A and the comments if there are other questions uh, I will start answering them now. So let's see, Igor is still here. Why would you suggest laying out gr grid drip irrigations under the sheet mulch, not above it? Good question. So the cardboard, while generally permeable to, uh, or paper if you use it, generally permeable to rain, meaning that it's not gonna like wash way off of your landscape, uh, the cardboard does kind of send it going in one direction or the other, sometimes to the edge of the sheet of cardboard if it's gotten kind of dry. It doesn't just soak right through in that exact place. So if you have a rain event, it'll still hydrate your landscape, but not right there. And so when you're watering with the drip irrigation, you want to make sure that that slow drip as it starts really gets exactly where it's going. That's the whole idea. Uh, just kind of the dynamics of what we find, and, and I don't really know about the physics of physics of how cardboard works, is that with an overhead spray irrigation, uh, it does tend to hydrate the landscape pretty evenly, even with the sheet mulch. But the drip irrigation, you know, if, if you really want to try it, you can, but I'm just much more comfortable since it's directly on uh, the landscape doing it underneath. There's not really a disadvantage to doing it underneath. And it's just a little bit more insurance that the water is going to get exactly where it's trying to go in that even spray. Um, that is the only question I am seeing right now. So I will continue to hang out. If there are any other questions, feel free to type them in. Or if there's any other comments, I'd love to uh, read them in the chat. But if there's not, I'll just hang out until people are done. Uh, everyone's finished the polls. Thank you very much. And, uh, and then I will uh, yeah, just wait in case there's any other questions as people uh, start to log out. So other question from Igor. Uh, so in that case, the drip irrigation should be laid down pretty much in the beginning. Uh, yeah, if you are going to be like uh, doing the the uh, sheet mulching like early on, you can you can do it you know pretty much at the beginning. What what I would do is if you're using it to kill your turf, you're going to want to like use a string trimmer to cut everything pretty pretty close, uh, so you have a nice good surface to work on. Then you could put down your drip irrigation, and then you can do your uh, sheet mulch on top of that. Okay, from Nick, any other sources other than would have word of mouth for good landscaping contractors? Uh, great question. Uh, we are, a, we're a public agency. So we're actually currently, uh, because there is such a high demand of people after they kind of get the design figured out, the next thing, if they're not doing it themselves is, is uh, how do I find the right contractor? We're currently working with consulting with our agency's lawyer and figuring out the limits of what we can or, or cannot uh, do in terms of connecting people with contractors. Uh, but here's what I will tell you. If you don't have good word of mouth, a couple of things you can do. If there are contractor installed landscapes, front yards that you admire in your neighborhood, you can always leave a note in someone's mailbox asking them, you know, did a contractor put it in? Who did the work? Would you recommend them? Uh, nothing like uh, getting good recommendation for someone who does work locally. 
if there are local nurseries that specialize in the kinds of plants you're putting in, then sometimes they will also have recommendations, especially if like, I'm not sure if you're in our local area, but uh, we have California Botanic Garden, which also has a nursery and they specialize in native plants and Theodore Payne Foundation. They will have uh, recommendations of landscapers or contractors that they know do that sort of work. Uh, some other retail nurseries might, not like a major corporate one necessarily like Armstrong, but specialty nursery if they're in your area might have recommendations. And then there's always, uh, you can try services like Angie's List uh, that are meant to connect people with contractors and then just really rely on uh, getting those good. If you follow that, then getting those good uh, references and uh, seeing other local projects that people have done. So hopefully one of those, and you might try pursuing all of those uh, approaches and then hopefully getting a few contractors who you can compare quotes from. Uh, good question. Okay, it looks like those are all of our questions. So have a good evening. Please join us for future workshops and good luck with your landscaping projects. Have a good evening.